What up, Whoa. everybody? Yo. Episode 121, baby. 121, we're here. And we're on time we for everybody watching live. We are on time today. I don't ever <coughs> wow. want to hear that we have any problems. We're on time. <clears throat> the first time in 120 episodes, we out here. <laughs> we're, we're starting to get the hang of it finally after three years or three and a half years. 120 yeah, episodes. Yeah, it takes some time. That's all it takes. That's it. For all you people starting but, uh, out, it takes a while, but we get there. <laughs> yeah, some people might be faster than us, but we'll see. Maybe, yeah, I guess so. Um, everyone, thanks for joining us. We have a very, very special guest today. A guest who I've been on a lot of trips with, but traveled around the world with, actually, and uh, has a very interesting story. He had an incredible comeback. He got Skater of the Year uh, in 2021, One Magazine, and I think a lot of people would agree the Comeback of the Year as well. So this should be a very exciting episode. He was one of our most requested guests. So I'm very excited to have him on. But first, if you haven't seen the show yet, please follow us on all of our social media pages. Go to our Facebook, hit the like button. Go to our YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. If you like what you're hearing, leave a comment, share. The interactions really help with the algorithm. We have an iTunes. Please give us a five-star rating. And if you like what you're hearing, give us a, re a review. We appreciate that. It helps boost us in all those algorithmic ways. And we also have a Patreon. Uh, you could be a patron with us for as little as $3 a month. When you become a patron, you get exclusive content. We do trick tips. We call them inside outs. We have three pieces. They're like quick little three-piece tricks we get with ourselves or our guests. Um, we do section reviews with our guests. We're going to do some with Demetrius after the show today. We're going to go through some of his most famous sections and have him comment and tell backstories and all that. It's really fun. We just did one with uh, Rawlinson on the battle with Calvin. And uh, we have a few really good ones in there. So, yeah. And every time you become a patron, you're you're in an entry every month to get something for free from our Patreon store. We have teas, we got hats, we got mugs. So three bucks a month, support Jump Street and get a chance to win something free from our store. And uh, yeah, get some exclusive content. So shout out, and that is the spiel. Hell yeah! Thank you for everyone supporting us on our Patreon. We have new uh, Patreon supporters this week. A special shout out to Bobby White, Ian McLinn, Life is a Skate Park, and Tim Katz. Thank you all for supporting. You're going to have some new Patreon content after tonight as well. Um, we have a WTF this week, as usual. and It's a good one. It's a good one. None other than it's a good one. the man himself, Chris Farmer, with an alley-oop negative macho. This one actually has a name. We don't often have WTFs that have uh, names, but alley-oop negative macho on a kink rail, which is probably a first ever NBD. So, um, if you got that, let us know because <laughs> I don't think anyone else got that. Yeah, that was shocking. This uh, this one hit Instagram pretty hard. Yeah, it went blade viral. Yeah, it went blade viral. It's blade pretty viral, intense, which means it has a hundred views. Yeah, no, don't say that. <laughs> blade viral. <laughs> <laughs> Huge We're shout still, out to Chris Farmer so and uh, yeah, that was incredible. Oh yeah, definitely. Um. We uh, we had last episode 120 with Dan Ogbogo. I, I, I haven't practiced his name in a week, so I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. But Ogbogo. Ogbogo. There you go. Ogbogo. Um, I think. It, yeah, it was a great episode. Very inspirational. Uh, we have a few of our viewers left a cool, cool comments, a few cool comments on this. So uh, first one we have is from Matt Potter, who said, this episode was so inspirational and watching his documentary was so good. I watched it twice and seeing all the people blade in any environment is the true love of the sport, which is, I definitely can agree with that 100%. Uh, he's talking yep. about the Dom West documentary, I believe, the uh, Streets of Lagos <clears throat> video. Um, yep. Judas Link also said, I'm so glad you guys got to interview him. I followed him a while ago, and him and his crew are insane. I remember DMing him about sketching and telling them to be careful because they can die. <laughs> Little did I know uh, they're used to it over there. Such a cool right. dude. Can't imagine the struggles he went through just to blade. So inspirational. Uh, yeah, that his sketching stories. He had like a half hour long story on sketching and how crazy it is and people like die from sketching over there it's, it's insane they have a whole different level of street skating in nigeria and in lagos particularly so if you haven't already check out one episode 120 with dan um it's out now youtube apple podcast spotify everything check it out if you haven't already extremely inspirational and motivational episode 
Yeah, yeah. If you if you see some of those clips in uh, Lagos of them sketching, it's unreal. They're like backwards on the back of the car in the middle of like crazy traffic, like three people hanging on, one guy's hanging on to each other, going backwards, like doing tricks. It's it's uh you know, we used to think we were doing some sketching back in New York, but this is like other level style. This is like a sport in and of itself. So um <clears throat> yeah, that was an incredible episode. So if you haven't had the opportunity to check it out, check that out. And uh we I have talked. We've got our sponsor back. Uh, Blank has become a sponsor on Jump Street once again. So huge shout out to our sponsor, Blank. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing everything from Blank and the Blank team in 2022. Hell yeah. Let's go forward. Let's keep it going. We love this relationship. Um, we have a very special guest today, like you said. Are we ready for our guest? I believe so. I believe so. Everybody, please welcome, without further ado, Mr. Demetrius George. There he is. I like the uh, I like the hearing there. That was clever. That's yeah, from, uh, it's nice. C- courtesy of Butter TV from the Blading Cup in like 2019. So that's actual skate contest footage. Like it's not just some generic shit. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's it's pretty up. cool. It's cool. Like when, when we first started, we had the um, it was like an awkward silence. You know, <laughs> it was like welcome to our guest, and then it was just like, <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? It's a little. But like um, it, yeah, it's it cool. Better and better, right? You guys refine it as we go, right? Absolutely. 120 episodes. We're still working on it. Oh, it's still great. going. <laughs> Yo, Demi- That's what I was telling you before. What were you going to say? I was going to say, Demetrius, thank you so much for joining us on this show. Uh, I, you know, I've been asking you to come on for quite some time, and you are one of our most highly recommended guests. Mm-hmm. And you know, I thought I thought it was appropriate to have you on after getting 2021 Skater of the Year, seeing everything you've done this year, your comeback, and like just what you've done on social media. It's just incredible. But before we get into all that, you know, we got to start at the beginning. You know, I know a little bit about your early days story coming into skating, but I don't know if everyone else does. So how did you first uh, enter this whole world of skating? Wow, that is a g- great question. Um <clears throat> You know, I grew up in Wyoming, Sheridan, Wyoming. It's a small town. It's got about, they had about maybe like 17,000 people back then. And uh, one of my good friends, Randy, actually, he he had started rollerblading. At that time, I had some skates. I think they were like rollerblade spirit blades. They had like some turquoise in there with like on the liner, little holes in them. But he, uh, he took me over to this uh, news station or like little news shop in the town, PO News, and they had they actually had rollerblade magazines. I think it was Inline Skate Mag or I don't know if it was Box Magazine or something. But we we picked up one of those and he showed me some of the things in there, and I was like, I was just you know you're a kid. I was like, there's no way you can do that on rollerblades. But anyways, he, t- he takes me down the street to. First Federal Savings Bank. I'll never forget that. And he tells me to jump on the curb. And he's like, just put your feet. Just put them like this. And I I went for it. And I just completely ate shit. Just flopped, smashed my body into the ground. And he freaks out. He comes up to me. He's like, oh, my God. You did a Royale with cheese. And I'm like, no way. I'm like, what is that? He's like, it's like when your ankles are turned like this, it's impossible. He goes, but then you lay your hand down and you style that shit out. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And that was pretty much it, man. From like, I fell and I hit hard and it, it woke me up. I think we can all relate to that, that feeling when you actually fall and you hit the ground. As much as it hurts, it immediately w- makes you feel like you're alive, you know? Hmm. And so after that, I started jumping the leash when my dad would walk the dog and and then next thing you know, I've uh, like my brother, Andre, who actually not many people know about. He Randy was actually his buddy because they were all about four or five years older than me. And so that was kind of helpful because all of his friends, which were mine, they all got into it. And <clears throat> so I, you know, we basically started getting into the game. We with Team Paradise, you know, finding all the gear, all the stuff. And I had ended up with some CDS Detroit plates that I drilled onto some uh, Majestic 12s that I ended up buying. I think my first skate, though, was like aggressive skate was the Tarmac CE. And the funny thing is, is I I had that skate and I rode it 
for not too long before I got the Majestic 12s, but I had it and I had it. I mean, I just remember for years knowing that was my first skate and I never knew the CE stood for Chris Edwards. <laughs> I was just, you know, that little kid that was skating just juiced. I think I started when I was like nine years old, which was what, back in 96 or something. I can't even wow. think. 95, I think. So, I mean, it was quite some time ago. And in a small town like Sheridan, the there wasn't, at that point, there really wasn't hatred, obviously, because rollerblading hadn't gone through the phase where skateboarding battered it. But in the town, there was bikers, you know, BMX, you had your skateboarders. And we ended up building, uh, building box ramps and everything. And we'd set them up out in the parking lots. And everybody from skateboarders to bikers, they would all jump on and just show up at these little gatherings. And we'd just basically chill and skate and that was the start of the love you know and from there it just it just grew it was uh that's, it was it was or go ahead no i was gonna say that's uh, interesting like especially starting that far back in skating like from like one of the earliest days but in sheridan wyoming so yeah. <laughs> it's like much like it's it was early and like new in like the bigger city so I, I would imagine it's even more so in sheridan at that point yeah well it was at that point, we were getting, you know, everything was on VHS, right? And so we were picking up as many skate videos as we could, like, you know, the hoax videos, the daily, or uh, the, I'm trying to think, like, what, harvesting the crust? I don't know if you remember <laughs> that. Yeah. Like, we <laughs> we had everything. And then, you know, the thing was, like, finding the secret sections in those. And, I mean, there was so much fun back then. And, obviously, you had Senate that was... It was just a trip. Like I, we ended up getting a hold of wholesale catalogs and became was able to purchase wholesale from Senate. So I mean, I was ordering crazy amounts of packages of stuff. I, I don't know. I've always been good at finding my little in to get things <laughs> like in a in a discounted way or like I buy shoes. <laughs> I do everything right. So I, I think it's funny that back in the day I was getting wholesale Senate gear. And uh, I just remember ordering all that stuff. And, of course, that's when you had all the uh, the tags that had its, uh, you know, the kill all, kill all and everything. <laughs> I don't want to destroy, destroy all girls. Destroy all girls. That's what it was. Yeah. You know, everything was, uh, I don't want to be too politically incorrect at this moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's what the history was. Yeah. And it was a trip back then. But, yeah, Wyoming was not your spot that you would think you'd get a skater out of i mean it was like dirt run-ups to rusted handrails little wow. you know barriers that for are for the car sales or car dealerships the little rails we'd skate and it wasn't your average thing but we used to go to we'd travel as much as we could and get to like these punk rock concerts where they'd have like mixed skateboarding and rollerblading and stuff and i just started doing my best to to show up but um it was my mother was quite the gypsy, so we moved around quite a bit. So when I was young, I mean, I had gone to like nine different schools before ninth grade. So that's how I met Richard at such a young age. Um, my brother Andre and I had gotten pretty good at skating, or at least we didn't really know we were good at skating. We just, coming out of Wyoming, you just skate hard, right? But we came to uh, Granada Hills, and we were living, living there for a little while. And uh, my brother, I think, was going to, God, what is it, John F. Kennedy or something. One of those one of those high schools in Granada Hills. And uh, he met up with this guy named Chris Marion, who now does all these cars and he's big in the car game. But he was one of our best friends. And he kept telling us about, there's this guy, he's the best skater in the Valley, he's the best. And we ended, we ended up finally meeting up. And this was the probably the craziest intro to my friendship with Richard because it was this anticipated meetup where the best skaters that Chris knew and like some of the skaters were meeting us and they thought we were really good and they really wanted us to meet up with these other best skaters they knew. And so we finally link up and uh, Richard's middle name is actually Andre. So the funny thing about it is when we go to introduce ourselves, 
my brother goes up to Richard first and he's like, Andre. And Richard's like, Andre, what are you talking about? And, and then Richard's best friend at the time, his name was Demetrius as well. So I go and introduce myself to him and we're both like Demetrius. And we look at each other and we're like, fuck you, man. I'm like, what are you, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> but ironically, we all had the same names. And so it was like a match, you know, it was just meant. And then, of course, Richard, we skate all night. He's doing these misty flips off of this little stage. It was just, I was tripping out because I wasn't at that level. I was still small. But um, uh, Richard stayed at our house that night. You know, we skated so late and his place was far. He ended up staying with us. Wake up in the morning. He like pours himself probably the largest bowl of cereal and just fills it up with what's left of our milk. <laughs> so my mother, right, she's she's Armenian Lebanese. She grew up in Beirut and she's got that intense accent and she does not hold American values the same, right? <laughs> she's, uh, so she she wakes up and she goes to make a coffee and Richard's like up watching cartoons or something, eating cereal. And she goes to make a coffee and all the milk's gone. And I just hear my mom like, who drank all the milk? I can't <laughs> believe you drink the milk. And the, so she sees Richard. She's like, gives him this. She starts ringing, reaming him. Imagine you're a kid and you're super embarrassed. <laughs> Always you're at that point where you're just like, the last thing you want is the best skater that everybody knows. And you're like, oh, like you're trying to create this good friendship. And here my mom starts telling him, you're so low class. I can't believe you would drink all the milk. No way. <laughs> oh, my God, Mom. Enough. Enough. Please give him a break. And Richard's looking at her like, oh, my. What do I do? Like, <laughs> How old are you guys then? God, I'm trying to think. I was probably like 12 years old. So Richard must have been 16 or something. 17. Okay. You she know? probably thought he was older. He should have known better. <laughs> drink all yeah, the milk. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but I just... You know, they they would have all been in high school basically or nearing the end. And it it was just it was funny, but it was it was a perfect way to start a friendship, true family, right? <laughs> and uh, but I, I bounced around so much that of course our amazing time skating in Granada Hills and I mean when I say amazing it's because and I don't mean to drag this on for so forever, but we're No, go keep going, man. It's great. <laughs> We used to take bus. I mean, first of all, we skated everywhere. I mean, I'm sure you guys can remember that when all we did was skate to spots, like skate 10, 15 miles. It would take you four yeah. hours to get to a spot. It's just oh, like, yeah. who would actually do that? Well, a bunch of kids with love and passion. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we would be doing that all over Silmar and the, the Valley, just everywhere we could, taking buses places. But some of the most fond memories I had were we'd take the bus all the way down to Venice Beach. And we used to go skate like the NIST competitions or at least go watch for me. I wasn't skating them, but we'd go watch all the NIST contests that were being held at Venice Beach. And, you know, there, that was when there was like, that i forget what it's called but that pavilion area with all the graffitied ledges and picnic benches and then you had the pavilion rails that were right out there and they there would be they'd set up the skate park or the the competition park all right there and i just remember going over there and like i it was i was never starstruck I just felt like I needed to be a part of it. Like this was where I belonged. Like I just, every, it was such a, a good feeling. I mean, you had TJ Weber and like everybody would be there and I'll never forget. Uh, um, God, I'm forgetting his name right now because I guess it's been so long, but uh, you know, who's the guy that did making dreams reality? Brian, Brian Bell, Brian Bell. I remember Brian Bell coming up to me like when I was skating those ledges and he's like, yo, man, he goes making dreams reality. He goes like, buy this. <laughs> and he was trying to sell me a tape for like 10 bucks. And like, I was like, dude, I need this tape, but I only have $5. Like, <laughs> so I, I mean, just to think that the people that I was watching on VHS at the time, just watching in all the good skate videos. Now here I am like, this young kid in the spot buying tapes from the famous guys, the guys that I looked up to. And it oh, was he gave you for five? 
He gave it to me for five. I mean, Score. but I think he – I don't want to, like, embellish the story, but I'm pretty sure he told me to do a trick. You know, <laughs> from what I recall, he told me to do a trick, and then I got it for five bucks because I did, like, a soul grind. But, so I mean – You earned it. One of, the, one of the coolest things, though, at those NIST competitions was – B Love actually gave me a, uh, well, I guess let me rewind. Everybody was having a session on the pavilion rails. Now, I don't know, you guys, you're familiar with the pavilion rails in Venice? Yeah, the it goes down the the platform, right? Yeah, it was just like down that little slope. Is that the, yeah, high handi- the, the high handicap rail? The high yeah, ones, right? Okay. Exactly. It yeah. was high, mm-hmm. right? It looked so, high yeah. as hell. So what's funny is it was extremely high for me i mean i was i was tiny i didn't grow until i was like six 15 16 years old at first i mean i was just tiny my whole life and so that rail was literally up to my shoulder and there was no way for me to jump on it but i i remember when they were sessioning it rawlinson rivera i think was sessioning it you had b love you had i can't remember who else but Everybody was just hitting souls and whatever they could front side. And I just charged it with all my might, like just this tiny ball. And I jumped as high as I could, probably gapped a good halfway down it. And I hit like the perfect soul grind. <laughs> and I just remember back then, you remember your skates were not ideal for doing tricks. So yeah. when you locked it and you really held style on it, you were like, like, that's the shit right there. You yeah. can feel it. That's that's why I think the love was so real back in the day because it took a lot for us to actually make it look good. And so, I mean, but that was, so then B love comes up to me after that and he gave me like this little sinner Senate sticker and he told me to put it on my helmet and he was like, put this on your helmet and get into the next NIST, NIST competition and we'll sponsor you. And I was like, all right, but like, you know me, I don't skate contests. So that, that never transpired. I just put that sticker into some little box and mm-hmm. he goes with that. I probably still have it. But it was it was the love, you know, like everybody, even if they were big or not, they they came and showed you love and they brought you yeah. into the family of blading. And I think you guys can relate in the sense that we all know this is a big family. It's got its it's got its finger pointing. I mean, it's almost like a high school to a degree when it gets too my like too granular. But the people that have excelled and gotten to the top of it, I think we all have a mutual respect for one another and what it is we've done. And so it's truly a family. I mean, you guys are family. I mean, Billy, you and I have just done so much together. And I, it's, the, it's the things that I imagined as a kid, you know, just being on the road, traveling, being with people that you meld and bring this relationship together that lasts a lifetime. And I'm so happy I... I found skating in that essence. It was, it was great when I was a kid and it continues to be. That's awesome, man. I love, first of all, like I love these stories. Like there's so much gold in these stories, like mm-hmm. the Senate story, the the story of a Richard and the milk. I just love that. That reminds <laughs> me of so many stories when I was a kid. Cause I used to have a lot of friends from the city come over and oh, yeah, you did. All, <laughs> ki- all kinds of funny stories. And it's relatable. Uh, we can get, yeah, we can get into that another time. But, um, <laughs> so like the, I felt like uh, so like one of your first breakout sections was the uh four three section, I mm-hmm. think, was like the one that really like got everyone's attention. So how did that come to be? Uh, how did you make this relationship with Joe? I know you already knew Richard for a while, but I'm sure this was you know, organic. But how did that all come to be? And the, and the splinter foot thing. We're going to have to talk about that for a second. <laughs> all right. So Joe's in the chat, can't... too, by the way. <laughs> I, I can't I can't get all the way into the four three section without backtracking to what it took to get there. And okay. so I left Lake Forest, I think it was like end of eighth grade. So I was basically gonna be going into ninth grade. And I was like an honors student. I was on top. I was gonna be going into like varsity track, all kinds of things. I was a great basketball player. I had all these things. I was definitely into school um but my mom being quite the gypsy and had some ups and downs in her relationships she uh we ended up moving quite often she she moved a lot and so when i got off i remember the day that i was done with school and was basically summer was starting 
And I got back and my mom tells me we're moving back to Wyoming. That crippled me. I was like, this is not, this is not what I want. I had seen my life. I wanted to be a pro rollerblader. I wanted to do all these things. So I get back to Wyoming and I get into this junior high, not even into high school. And like, there's this uh, auditorium that they put us into. And there's this truancy officer that's got to be like this almost 300 pound woman with a full mullet, like military mullet, but just huge. And she's like, she's yelling at this auditorium of seventh and eighth graders telling them that if you get three strikes, you're going to a group home. And like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm back in the Midwest, like jail. I mean, that's what they do in those small towns. You know, they had cops everywhere to bust you and get you into some kind of issue where you just get stuck in that rut. And Mm -hmm. so I was, I was so over it that I remember I, it was like maybe a couple months of school that I did before I, finally just told my teachers that I wasn't going to do it and that I was going to come out of school and try to get into homeschooling. And so I did that. And then I just focused my time on skating. Of course, I was like doing all kinds of stuff. I was running. My dad had an army surplus store at the time that my mom was like a hippie and had turned into this crazy store with a black light room and body jewelry (laughs) and and the rock shirts, Grateful Dead. So we had everything from VA veterans to the punk rock kids to, you know, actual people looking for camping gear and MREs, who knows? It was an interesting slew, but I was managing that store. At the time, my dad was, you know, he was an alcoholic and he was kind of non-existent. My mom turned into a lesbian and that was interesting. But then she moved to Colorado. So at one point, now I'm not going to shun my parents because my parents are awesome. They're my best friends. So mm-hmm. don't think that any of this was bad. Life happens, right? Or at least that's what I learned. And our relationship's great. But at the time, my mom was like living in Colorado for a bit. And my dad was, you know, he was on a, on a roller coaster. So I was managing this store by myself, renting out my own apartment. I was like 15 years old. And just skating my ass off, like all I could think was I'm going to get to California and I'm going to become a pro rollerblader. And but we would get hassled from the cops. They'd stop us and they'd given us like a a two block radius from Main Street that I wasn't allowed to rollerblade or ride bikes or anything. But I lived on Main Street, so I was getting tickets every day, getting in trouble every day, trying to skate back just to my house. Finally, I get stopped by a cop that's on his bicycle and uh, he tells me to stick out my tongue. And I'm like, no. And he's like, stick oh, yeah, out I know the story. <laughs> he tells me, stick out your tongue, son. And I'm just like, uh, eh. <laughs> and so he, he, I stick it. He's like, stick it out further. And I stick out my tongue and he goes, yep, your tongue's green. I'm writing you up for an under the use of controlled substance. And I'm like, you're shitting me. And anyways, he just doesn't respond to anything I say after that. I end up on probation with a a supervised, you know, or whatever it is, or unsupervised, but random once a month urinal analysis test I had to take. I took those things for like four or five months before they stopped calling me. And I didn't know why they stopped calling me. And I felt like there was a good chance they were trying to do to me what they had done to some of my other friends. And they were try to make it seem as if I wasn't going and I got falses so that I I didn't want to get trapped in that town. So I ended up getting like a bus ticket out of there basically. And I came straight to California while I was on probation um, and stayed with my brother in Orange County or Newport Beach. He was staying with his a good friend of ours, Robert Hollis, whom you might know he's a rollerblader as well from back in the day. And uh, I stayed with them, and I just remember I was, like, doing whatever I could to go skating. They would take me skating. I'd go skate on my own, show up wherever I could. And there was these Michelson ledges. And I, at that point, I, Richard wasn't really talking to any of us. He was, like, he had blown up. And I'm not saying he wasn't talking to us because he was too cool. But he had blown up, and he was doing a lot of stuff. So we hadn't really rekindled our our close-knit friendship but I, we were still skating and just holding our own. 
And I ended up like I when I found the Michelson ledges, I kept going back to those. And then I found these bison ledges. And I think it was the bison ledges where there's the 666 rail that Chris Haffey does. And there was these curved ledges near the baseball park. And I saw a bunch of people skating there. And I was there like by myself. But I, I just just started skating the session that they were skating and trying to hit a true spin mistrial, like as tight and as style as I could. And I just kept going in the trick. And I remember like getting some off looks. I didn't know who the skaters were. Might have been Jeff Stockwell looking back at it. But either way... The guy that was taking the photos was Jess Dyron for it. And uh, so I ended up meeting him and he was kind of like, who are you, mate? You know, like, what is this? You know, like, I like your drive. I like what you're doing. And he was kind of like giving me like a little, little mode of respect. And so I got his number and then it wasn't but a couple of days later, he said he wanted to take me skating. So I told him where I wanted to go. And he's like, no, I've already shot that rail. And I was like, no, I wanted to, it was this rail in like Mission Viejo. It was like a 50 stair handrail that lands and goes into a, a dugout, baseball dugout. And he's like, oh, I've already shot it. And, he was, and I was like, well, I don't think you've shot what I'm going to try on it. And he was like, well, what are you going to try? And then I went for two spin Mizu. And he was just like, why? Like, he's thinking in his head, like, why would you do this? I was like 16 years old, you know? Anyway, so then I ended up landing the true spin Mizu. And that was my. I didn't know because I hardly knew Jess. I hardly knew anything, but that was kind of it. And then I ended up getting hit up from him a little while later. And he told me, oh, your your photo is going to go into print. And so that ended up going into Rejects magazine. Can't remember what issue number it is. I think I have it somewhere. Maybe I can go find it. But um, it, that was my first photo that got into a magazine. It was like a true spin Mizu on that 50 stair. And I, I think I was wearing like white UFS thrums at the time. And it was it was kind of like my breakthrough photo. And so from there, I don't know. I'm trying to think how I, I got into reaching out to Richard and found out that he was in Tustin. And that by that time, my mom was uh, living in, she had come from Colorado and got a place in Tustin. So now I was in Tustin because I went back to live with her. And we rekindled our friendship. And I do got to say this because it's funny. And I know Richard's probably laughing if he's watching this because I'm going to call him out. But being my homie from back in the day, I remember he had... Um, I wanted to get new skates and I was trying to get some new skates from him. And like, you know, I respect this cause everybody was hustling back then, but he was like, Oh yeah. And I told him, I was like, what's it going to cost, man. And then I, I had come up on some playstations. I think there were PlayStation twos. One of my mom's friends was like a truck driver for Swift. And it was the telltale story. Like, Oh, these playstations fell off the truck, you know? <laughs> I was like, so I had some extra ones aside from the one that I had. And so I ended up hooking him up with like a $300 PlayStation, but he hooked me up with like a pair of skates and a bunch of shit. But then of course, soon after that, like he took me to Big Dan Importing where there was Scott Walker, who I got a shout out because he really helped me get kind of some respect in that space. He started sending me to these little events and putting me in these little areas where I was able to get seen to a degree. He tried getting me to skate like ASA contests. And I remember I went for him that he paid for me to skate this ASA contest. And I was like so nervous. I didn't skate contests. I had no stamina. I was just this street skater out of Wyoming. And I, I turn around and like, I, I can't even remember what place I get, but I don't even think I passed qualifiers. But the funny thing was, is Cameron Card was one of the judges. Mm -hmm. And so the, the only reason that was funny was because at the same time that he had judged and put me obviously not past the qualifiers, <laughs> which is in all respect, a prob probably a great call because I probably did absolutely shit. But I left that like, oh, I didn't make the qualifiers. All right, well, screw it. And I went like around the corner and there were these down rails. I can't remember the down rails or handicap rails, but they were tall and they were something that nobody wanted to skate. And then I just started shredding them, like doing like 
you know, true Mizzy or true all my classic tricks, my two top soyal and some switch ups and and full cabs and and like was just you know, having a good time on street. And I got like a bunch of attention and a bunch of people that came over there. And I remember Scott told me about it. He's like, well, you didn't do good at the contest, but everybody talked about you more from what you did on the outside of it. And that was pretty cool. And it kind of, it kind of grew up or just started growing in that, in that space, going to uh Monarch or Monarchy, I think, or what was it? The Monarch, Monarch Monarchy. Th- Monarch yeah, distribution. distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Monarch distribution like and like so there with lawrence and jess and getting hooked up with 50 50 and it was really that's where i always kind of felt like it was interesting i had those nerves where i never felt good enough but i i was happy that i was where i was and starting to talk to people and starting to make connections but i never really felt like i was as good as some of the people that i watched on that were skating but it was something that I guess pushed me more, right? So anything I got, anything I was given, I was always willing to push hard, push harder and just try my best. But I mean, looking back, it's a trip because I really was with the OGs. You know, I was young, but I made it, I made it in before a lot of that kind of started to crumble because of everything, you know, but um, it was, it was great times. So now you asked about four, three, you know, I'm not going to hang up. So, but that was a that was a big journey to getting there, and in that process, Richard and I really had really grown tight again. I think I think it helped that he now had somebody that was close to him that was skating not necessarily at his level, but was getting there. Right? I mean, I always looked up to Richard, but I didn't as much as everybody was like looked at Richard like he was the greatest. He was just, he was truly my best friend. So I was never like intimidated or worried about anything he did on his skates. I was just skating with him. So we would just push ourselves so hard and just have like, I remember we used to go to Bake Parkway, these ledges that were pretty famous, like a handicap ledge or handicap rail to this little down ledge. I forget what movies they're in, but we used to skate and just absolutely kill. I mean, we didn't have cameras at some, you know, through a lot of this. And we would just do everything, full cap, true fish brains, full cap, true top acids, like true fish brain to inspin soul on like Greenfield down rail, like things that we never filmed, but we just would kill. That was all we did. We just had a blast. And then eventually we realized like that we needed our own camera. So instead of Joe filming Richard, we ended up getting a GL1 or whatever. And then I, you know. I think I ended up getting a GL1 later and then eventually you got your GL2, right? But at that time we started filming and I really loved filming. So I would film Richard and he would film me. And we I hadn't really met Joe and those guys yet, but I he took me over to Joe's house and the first time I met Joe and them they were playing a a poker game like a like a twenty dollar buy-in cash game and so i was you know obviously young and joe and these guys they were playing like some big games i think at the time joe might have even done, been going to some wsops you know putting some some real chips down but uh i jumped in and i think i took out joe like maybe three or four times like out of the game and he was he was like he i don't think he was too happy about that but i remember i i cleaned shop like i just i i just cleaned it cleaned a lot of them out i was calling people on a lot of shit a lot of bluffs and i came in with quite a bit of attitude i think travis steen slid another friend maybe i'm sure you guys know him but he was uh he was a homie from back then and he he wrote about it in my daily bread interview that i ended up getting uh which was probably one of my better interviews but he wrote about it or i guess i should say like spreads with photos and he talked about how i kind of sat in and i was this you know young kid that just showed up and wrecked house and poker but it was true and it it kind of garnished me a little bit of respect with all those guys because i didn't come in all just hesitant um i always was loud I was a loud person. I think people used to call me cocky and sometimes people to a degree 
misconstrue what I'm doing to keep myself confident um, as cocky. But I think in any sport, for instance, when you're putting your life on the line or you're, you've really got to apply yourself, I think it's okay to bring that level of confidence because it's what's protecting you. It's what's putting you in the zone and really gets you in a space where you can focus on what you want to do. So, hey, you know, like be cocky if you need to, if it keeps you safe. <laughs> but uh, I, I went through <laughs> I went through a lot of that and uh, and it helped. You know, I, I remember that's how it kind of started with the four three section, the idea of it. Joe was filming and he had, was filming all these skaters, but I was filming Richard and a good amount of my clips that I was filming were being given to him for the four, three section. So I felt like, I mean, I'm not going to film Richard and not get a section myself. So I kept saying like, come on, man, like I'm getting the section, Joe, like you're giving me a section. And he just kept <laughs> saying, like, Oh yeah, I'm going to give you a section. And I'm like, Hell, yeah, you're going to give me a section. <laughs> so then it became kind of this funny game where he just kept giving me these funny eyes when he'd be editing. And then we would come back with more and more clips and like, and giving him clips. And I think we hopped in the car and we were going to go skate. And it was right around there. These, this time when the orange County fires had really lit up all of orange County and the skies were just orange like everywhere when the sun was it was just crazy how it looked everything was like that perfect golden hour look that you would hope for when you're filming so we were trying to sneak in as many clips as we could even though it wasn't healthy to be skating out in that weather um and i was in joe's car in the back and i i don't know who else was there but he was like okay so if i'm going to give you a section what what uh what music are you going to use and it was like, you know, he was he had that executive approach, like, OK, you can give me you're going to get a section. What are you, what are you going to use? And I and without hesitation, I told him M-E-T-H-O-D man. From Wu -Tang. Wu -Tang. Let's go. <laughs> and he looks at me in the mirror. I remember he was like, oh, yeah, OK, <laughs> you know, and he puts it on in the car and I'm just like vibing, going to the spot. And we got to these like these rails i can't remember they were near they were near like uh god where is it just south orange county and there was uh a down rail like this short black down rail on the right and it landed and then you had to turn and make a quick left and then there was this big long black down rail with like dirt on the right hand side but it was it was steep and it was gnarly um and i i did back fast light on the first rail this is in my four three section but i did back fast light on the first rail and then i i swooped around the corner and then i held an alley topsail that's kind of with, right yeah, kind of with that bryant rutledge look you know where he just laid barreled out in the just barrel and it's like yeah. in it and then there it goes squatted right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I kind of hit it like that. And I just remember uh, when I landed it, I got some looks from everybody like, yeah, this kid's getting a section. <laughs> you know, it was it was kind of solidified because I think that might have been one of the first clips that I finally had filmed of me that was filmed by Joe. You know, everything else, a lot of the stuff was filmed by either Carlos Pianowski or Richard. And looking back at 4-3, you know, Joe filmed a good amount, but I will say I filmed quite a few of those Carlos and Richard clips, which makes me feel good because that was a, you know, even though I don't necessarily have credit in that area, when I watch it and when I look back in the memory, I can remember everything, you know, through the lens, like filming and panning and zooming and just like, I remember my favorite clip that I filmed was, I think, of Richard at this Lake Forest Elementary kink rail where he does a top sole and gaps the flat and does top, you know, like it's like a transfer, oh, gaps yeah. the flat, top sole, top sole. And like, I don't know, just knowing that I had captured some of those moments where, you know, it was a good feeling. So the, the one at Moore Park was it the one at Moore Park. No, that one that he did was the. More park, he did like topsole, true soil. Yeah, this one yeah. was like topsole to topsole. It's like a really big kink rail, 
and I'm trying to think if it's in his four three uh, seconds. I remember this. I think I remember this one. It's a big rail, and like yeah. it's like it's following him, and there's some fence behind, and then it opens up, and and he's got his you know big old sweatpants on back in the day, you know, like <laughs> we were wearing quadruple X everything, you know, anything yes. we could. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was uh, that was definitely a great memory just like that whole pushing hard as hard as i could to be there to be in that video i didn't want to miss it i didn't want to miss that chance to be a part of it and man i'll tell you right now i that going to that uh sorry i'm stuttering but going to the movie premiere they did it in like balboa island which was at some lido theater i think it was and so this was like a real theater, you know, with near all the ballers down in like Newport Beach area. And it was sick. The people were everywhere. The streets were filled up and watching, you know, being there. I still wasn't happy with my section. I didn't feel like it had enough variety. But filming that section, like I had to be happy with what I could get because you asked something else, and that was about the splinter. Hmm. Now that splinter, splinter foot, splinter foot. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that had gotten into my foot when I was in Wyoming many years earlier, like three years, years? earlier. Yeah, you had and that in like, your foot for years. <laughs> for three years, so I was dragging like my feet. your whole time skating. You yeah, were <laughs> no. So get this. So I'm dragging my feet, and I'm going in between. Uh, the kitchen and the uh, the living room and it was like linoleum to a wood floor but it once was carpet but it got pulled up and then the wood floor was chipped and the wood floor had like little pieces of splinters that were kind of up I didn't really know that but we were always very careful and would walk over that section it just hadn't been fixed yet you know I mean it's ghetto we weren't wealthy by any means we just did whatever but I was a little I think we had had some drinks that night i was young but either way i wasn't drunk by any means but i was tired and i woke up to go take a piss and i was walking to the living room and i was dragging my feet i guess and my foot just like caught the wood and just peeled up the floor and i just broke off the floor so then i had like this piece of wood sticking out of my arch and I'd go to pull on it and it just wouldn't come out. But I, of course, I'm like so tired and I can't believe what's going on. I grab it as hard as I can and I ripped it out. I go back to sleep. I wake up in the morning and I go to walk and my foot is like just like a balloon and it's just crazy. So I tried going down some stairs. I pass out. I ended up like rolling down these stairs. Long story short, I'm at some doctor. And he's my pediatrician. You know, I'm st- he was he was my. This is Wyoming, right? So, <laughs> I'm gonna go to my trusted doctor, Doctor Wool. You know, and so I go to like my pediatrician, <laughs> and he uh, he tells me he's like, okay, so you got wood in your foot, or, but here's the problem: it's not gonna be easy to locate. For one, it's wood, so on an X-ray, it's hard to see. So what had happened is if you want to remove it, we're going to slice up your arch. And if we slice up your arch, like who knows, your your muscles will never come back together again and you might not walk or be able to do the thing that's normal. So I recommend that you don't take it out. He goes, I've seen a woman that stepped on a small pin nail and it came out seven years later out of the back of her heel. And I was wow. like, okay, I'll, just, I'll just trust you, Dr. Wool. You've been with me since I was a baby. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, I leave this piece of wood in my foot and it turns into like this rod of calcium and tissue. So on my foot for the longest time, almost looked like a finger was underneath my skin. This like just protruding. And now I skated on it and it kept my foot was always tense, but it just became like a piece of my foot. But it was always sore, but not really, just like it kept the muscles tight, right? But years later, I'm bef- while I'm f- like right before, it might have even been when I was filming 4-3. Actually, that's what it, I broke my foot during the filming of 4-3, during the section, the, the time of that. 
like when it was i think when it was beginning filming but i was already like maybe a few months into it or whatever and i broke my foot actually skateboarding so the funny thing was is i skated this rail that was at some parking lot out or parking structure outside of rsa skate park or once was far side for all the ogs that can remember far side um but there was this big rail that it's been in some of my videos, but it comes from a, uh, this parking lot up above and it's got a huge like 18 foot drop on it. Well, I fell off that rail the day before I broke my foot and I fell 18 feet and I landed and collapsed and somehow I didn't break anything, my ankle or anything. I didn't hurt my knees. It was just like a miraculous. I got carried by an angel or who knows, wow. but I ended up, the very next day I'm dropping in on like an eight foot half pipe with a skateboard because I was all right at skateboarding, but I was, for whatever reason, I tried doing that and I slipped out and like pushed my foot into the ground when I hit the flat bottom and I snapped uh, three bones in my foot. They like snapped sideways, right? Like Ugh. these bones, like, they all snap. And so, I ended up, my I heal pretty fast. So this broken foot healed in probably like a month, maybe a month and like a half. And once it was healed, I'm like, all right, I'm going to start skating again. And I pretty much threw on my skates and started skating. But then I started feeling this like tremendous amount of pain on my, where my big toe bone is like right here, but in between the big toe and that spot, I mean, where you guys have seen the splinter come out, I started feeling pain there. And then it like turned into a little lump and then it really started to like get tense. And then my toe got locked up because all like it started to form almost like a tumor that locked up the ability for my toe to move. So I went to like three different, maybe four different doctors that, kept taking x-rays and whatnot and i couldn't really afford an mri at the time but i kept getting all these things done and they kept telling me oh it's a hematoma oh it's this but it kept growing eventually it was really bad i mean filming four three honestly was one of the most difficult things i've ever done in my life because each time i went to put on my skate it felt exactly like what you would imagine it feels like if you were to take wood and try to push it through tissue and just keep pushing it so wow. the, it felt like somebody was taking a torch and just holding it on top of my skin and so like it was interesting because i'd go to put my foot in a skate and it just felt like something was stabbing me and literally wouldn't go away but it was excruciating but I'd get my foot onto the skate and then I'd have to sit there for hello. <laughs> Hi, Tina. Um, I'd have to sit there for like a good 15 minutes, just doing squats in my skate until the nerves in my foot would just die. <laughs> <laughs> and so my, my foot would just out of nowhere die. The nerves were gone and I'd be like, all right, let's skate. I can do this now. Like, and then I would start skating. And each time I would take my foot out of the skate, that swollen little tumor would essentially be a little bit bigger. And so mm -hmm. it kept getting bigger and bigger. And then eventually, finally, I have a doctor that's like, I'm going down to Mexico. I'm going down to Mexico <laughs> and I'll be back tomorrow. And we're going to do a, a little biopsy on it to see what's up with it. Biopsy on this tumor. Yeah, and so when did you completely that, forget like about the um, about the wood chip at this point? Were you thinking it was a no, tumor? No, no, no. I was very confidently telling these doctors like, "You guys okay. are nuts! Like it's wood." Like, <laughs> like, can you believe me? Yeah, and they just kept saying wood wouldn't be that hard. Like they think maybe they thought it was a splinter. I mean, I don't know. You know, I'm trying to understand really what it was they were contemplating. But you know, doctors they read a textbook and they try to apply it to you. There's not exactly. too many that actually pay attention to what you're saying, which is mm -hmm. why to this day I focus on my own self, on my own body and listening to it. And I don't just go to somebody else for them to tell me what's wrong. 
I see what I can do and I try to address my own issues. But probably things like this didn't help for that, right? So this doctor straight tells me before he's going down there that he, because he used an ultrasound on it and he said it was like, he thought it was bad and he basically, he inclined that it could be cancerous. So we really got to get in there. So my mom's like crying, leaving this doctor. It's like this whole experience. I literally leave the doctor and then I go skating that night with Richard and everybody and I skated and it was, it was massive at this time. And I don't even know how I was skating, but I had to get some of my last tricks in. And so we went to El Toro and that's when I did the full cap true top soy out to true spin porn star. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. so I laced that with like excruciating pain with that splinter in my foot. And that's when you guys see that little clip where I pull off the skate and I, splinter foot (laughs) and so the next morning i wake up and that tumor had formed this like little black almost or not black but this like little white head pimple but it was kind of dark underneath it and i was like oh my god about time i get to pop this shit it's (laughs) finally time so i call up richard and i'm like yo come over here right now and film this and he, came <laughs> over, he, he comes over with Brandon Campbell and like, okay. and then my buddy, Andy Benitez and they come over and they just like show up and I, I'm like, yo, you came I'm with a gang. Pop. Yeah. I'm we got to see this right now. <laughs> yeah. And Brandon like was funny because of all the people that was gangster, he's like looking at this thing and he's like, uh, uh, he was so <laughs> sick. He could not handle it. He he was like, why? Oh, no, don't do it. Like, But I got under this tumor, and I just kept working on it and working on it. And then, like, like eventually I just squeezed and popped it, and then I just kept working on it as if it was a splinter, just assuming it's a splinter. And, like, magic, it, like, out of nowhere, this, like, weird, like, like fluid showed up on the side of my foot, and I could see it. And I'm like, oh, man. And right when I push on that, spot that's when that splinter just shot up out of my foot now i'm telling you right now to have something in your foot for that long and then turn around and it shot out of my foot it you know like it looks fake in the video grab it with tweezers or something like shit like like (laughs) shot out of my foot to the point where i'm pretty sure anybody that's watched it online thinks it's fake if only we were like had hd cameras and like multiple cameras. Cause at that time, like Richard was so annoyed by my mom talking constantly, like, well, get it this way, get it this way. She just kept talking, you know, and Richard, you can hear him in the background. He's like, oh God, he's just so annoyed by it. And he's moving the camera at the time when it pops out. But, but yeah, and it pops out of my foot. I pulled that thing out and I swear to God, I ran. I went barefoot and I went outside and I ran. And it was like taking a hot shower for the first time after two months or something. Like the 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 feeling that I got like of just euphoria and pleasure that I was able to run on my foot without feeling like a torch on it was amazing. And so yeah, that was Splinter Foot. And I'm excited that it <laughs> that it came out the way it did. But you know, I never took the footage though and sent it to the doctors. Everybody kept saying, why didn't you take that footage and send it to those doctors? To Shut show them up. What's up? And I'm just like, you know, because because then if anything, then they're going to use this as an experience. And then they're going to tell somebody that actually has cancer that it's wood. You know, let's let them live. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So, so you initially got it underneath your foot and it came out on yeah. top. So it went through your yeah, entire yeah. foot so in the long run. In the base of my foot for like three years and then somehow after my foot from the bright when i broke it and it was so swollen it like went from being sideways to like vertical and then just started pushing up through the meat that is insane it went through your entire foot holy shit yeah it was was crazy it it was not easy but yeah that like i remember i was regretting like my section felt like it wasn't good enough but i was like you know internally i had to be happy with what i did because not everybody knows like people watch things online they watch videos they don't know what comes along with the tricks right a lot of times there's so many variables with your skating that are at play 
And it's hard for them to understand that, but they just see the finished product and then they, they talk about it. I've never been really too worried about it, but I talk about my own skating. You know, I watch my own skating and I constantly dislike it. I'm constantly unhappy with my skating, but I think that's probably what makes us good at what we do, you know, wanting to better it and knowing what we did wrong um, mm-hmm. or what we could do better or what we could add to it if we want to. But I've never been one to really like focus on my style, you know, and I think I see what where skating is nowadays with so much style and like really applying that to each of tr- each of their tricks. Yeah, you know, I wanted to I wanted to mention that with you. I don't mean to cut you off, but, you know, there was there was a a bit where, um, you know, on there was um, I think there's a bit where there's like some older skaters and like some new style and like a clash when some new skaters came back and younger skaters being defensive. And I think you got to you had like a thing on Instagram where you, where you were addressing that. And it seems like that's the way you're going right now. So if, if you wanted to formally kind of get on that. Um, maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's a natural progression yeah. into that. Um, that, that's so much, it's a much deeper topic than I imagined it would be in rollerblading today, but it surely seems to be the case. And it's understandable because just like history shows us with anything, like nothing really changes. We're always still people, right? We always still have similar emotions, regardless of when the times are and whatever. So I can understand that like skating has its its characters as it should and has its different difference in style. But what's what was interesting for me is when I started skating, I just wanted to skate, right? And it was a lot of fun. And I got I got into this push to I really just did a trick put the trick online kind of like exploded into oh people like what i do still that's cool but i just want to get healthy and start skating again because it was more for like the fact of bringing some mental health in but right away like with my skating i noticed you know because i started doing as what people were calling hammers and uh bigger tricks um but not like the technical things that everybody's doing you know there's a lot of technical tricks and on maybe lower things, ledges or curbs or smaller rails. And that doesn't really change at all how difficult the trick is. But still, from a perception standpoint, I think some of the OGs, as you were saying, like some of the older skaters, they really were vibing with what I was doing. And there was those comments that started to layer in, of, you know, I'm bringing rollerblading back or the real rollerblading. And then you had like the... I think I didn't get so many comments from the younger crowd as much to hear the negative from them, but presumably it was easy to consider that if the older people are saying all this and they're kind of coming at it aggressively like that, there's a good chance that even though I'm not hearing it, that the younger crowd or the stylish and the other kinds of skaters nowadays are creating this divided wall as to where maybe I don't like them and I'm doing gangster shit and you guys should skate like me. Now, that's obviously not the case, but I ended up uh, I ended up posting one of your good friends, Lewis. I forget what his Instagram thing. Yeah, Lewis and it Gross. was Yeah, and it was like a genuine I think afterwards I looked at it and I could see how it was perceived by some as me calling him out and trying to blow him up in the negative way. But I'm very communicative. And I'm not afraid to face um, things that may be negative. And I think it's better for us to address it. And I'm okay with making mistakes along that process because I have people with strong characters that come in and they set me in a way that they can give me their, their perspective. And so I think it's okay. I think that's what it's all about. We can't shy down from who we are. It takes us to be who we are to open up that dialogue. So I called him out on a comment he made on your guys' drum street. Cause at that point I had really no idea what's going on with the industry. I just was hearing comments and, and I, he made a comment about, uh, you know, like do your big things like cool. That's cool for you, bro or something. And to a degree I was saying, I can't help but think like this guy's calling me out for as if, Oh, just go do what you do, but I don't necessarily care about it. I'm going to stick in my lane. 
but it took more for me to really understand. I had a great conversation with Billy. I actually got on a, a really good conversation of FaceTime with Yandriel, uh, you know, who's very close to um, Yandriel, the guy that won the Bashi Pope this year, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. or this last year. And he's a really close friend of Lewis's as well. And so we had this, I don't know, like an hour and a half long conversation about really what I was looking to see and really what kind of conversation I was hoping to open up. And it was a lot of fun because what people don't know is I posted that about Lewis, but then I ended up with like 30 or 40 conversations in my DMs that lasted a good amount of time talking about where the industry was. So then I got to learn a lot about where people are. And I found out that there really was this divide that was going on between the OGs, as people like to say, and the young crowd in this sport right now, or the people who are finding their place. And so I, I could see where me coming in as what some would say hot, you know, skating hard, doing stuff, posting and being myself within it, could maybe start to take away shine or some eyes on people that deserve that respect and deserve to be kind of coming up in the game. But in no way is that my intention. I'm just skating the way I like to. And, and if that's, I think the best thing we could do is bring each other along. And that's actually where if, instead of talking about like the divide and a formal apology to Lewis, if he feels like I did offend him because I like his skating I like his style. More than anything, I'm going to say this, not just being nice. There's a certain group of skaters that I've always respected, and it's those who really hold their own in, in their character and their style. Billy, you and Austin are those guys. Back when I grew up, I was watching you guys. You guys were always like representative of your character, where you came from, and your style, and you could tell that it was genuinely who you were, right? I came from Wyoming, always just had desire to skate. I didn't come with any like too many. I mean, my upbringing from the valley and different parts and different parts of ghetto areas and whatnot. But in reality, I always just skated for fun. I always just wanted to try my hardest. And I've always been there just doing my best to kind of like excite people. I always really liked doing a trick that would get people excited. So I didn't focus as much on style or my landings or things. So I remember a lot of my earlier tricks in my earlier years, you'd see one foot pop up at the end of a trick. And like, even though it would have maybe later on bothered me in the time, like I was just happy to be skating and doing tricks. And so it was interesting realizing that nowadays with kids and how they're so refined in their style and how the older crowd really wasn't showing them love, you know, and the younger crowd, not so much showing as much love to the older. And I really hope that at some point we as rollerbladers can realize that if each of us posted each of the, like if we reposted content from somebody we enjoy in the rollerblading community, instead of creating an image for our Instagram page, instead of creating a, an image for what we want to be represented to the core market, we might actually tap into the algorithm that you mentioned at the beginning of this show, you know, make comments, shares, likes, and put us into that algorithmic, you know, universe where we're actually able to start being seen by masses and seen by others. And so instead of like, for me, instead of being too worried about the separation of us, I've, I've really just been trying to have good conversations with everybody I meet and whomever I'm skating with and give them my, my thoughts on where we can go for blading. I mean, yeah, I was out of skating for a long time, and I don't know what everybody's gone through over the years that I was out, and I'm not as uh, aware of all of the issues that the industry is having right now. I mean, back in the day, I was the guy that was on the road dealing with product development, manufacturing, team management, you know, putting together whatever I could for us. But I've missed a step there and I don't know everything that's going on. I came in with a lot of drive to get going, to, to build companies, to build up. And it wasn't 
it didn't take me long before I realized that there's a lot of people doing things right now and doing things in a good way. And to instead of like flood the market with what I wanted to do, that it was a good time for me to really just focus on my health and build myself back up to what I wanted to do with my own happiness. And that is skate again, skate hard again. I didn't want to skate and be like, oh, I'm skating again and just do some tricks and go to the park. I don't really have fun going to skate parks. Like, that's awesome and all. I love meeting up with everybody at the park and doing something. But speaking from my heart, if we go to a skate park and there's a big session or a Sunday night session, the only time I'm really going to and truly enjoy it is if the park has something there that I can do something on that really makes me feel proud of my skating for that evening. And of course I could find that on that genre of skating, but I just have fun doing random shit, gapping to rails. So I'll find if I go to a skate park, I'm happy if I find some launch out of a ramp to a rail that I can do some switch ups on and then gap back in because there's a chance that not everybody's skating it. And it makes me feel like it's street esque. Like I'm able to bring a little bit of the street to it. Something that not everybody's skating. I don't know. I'm not, it's not like I'm intimidated to go up against the things, but sometimes to a degree, you know, you're like, man, like that guy's going to fakey seven off of that quarter. And that was sick. I don't really feel like trying fakey fives on that. Like, not that I, not that I'm not going to like it, but I'm also old. <laughs> I'm also old enough to where I am balancing what I'm going to try. And if I know that I'm going to hurt myself doing something that I'm not comfortable with, I'd rather save my body for the big disaster to rail that I'm going to do tomorrow for, with my homies filming. And so I'll go to those things and enjoy them and have fun with everybody. But from a skating perspective, I don't enjoy it as much. And so I, it's tough for me to be too, um, I don't know, too concerned about like what people think about that. It's, I, I, I want to, ex, you know, take my skating to other levels and be respected in that area. But really at this point for me with rollerblading, I'm just happy to be on my skates. It's a it's a good feeling and it just reminds me each day when I'm trying something. But with all that being said, I think the industry is on a good path. You have a lot of good a lot of young rollerbladers in here that are actually I mean like your Mesmer team for instance. You've got some people on your team that you can tell have youth but really have a future with skating as long as they stick with it, which I assume they all will. You can see they're dedicated. But there's, there's promise in the sport with different styles that touch all different genres nowadays. And, and I'm excited to be back because I think I bring a genre to the sport that may be helpful for it. That may be, it maybe I'm older. I'm not the guy that's the young guy that everybody on Instagram is going to dress like me. But at the same time, I think some of the skating I do brings eyes to rollerblading and in general that's that's the end all be all if we have more eyes on rollerblading it's not to take it so mainstream and pull it out of what it's what everybody likes about it but it would be nice for to see those younger kids that are on your team and all these other teams to see them have a chance to become financially stable through rollerblading yeah. and so i hope that i can i hope that my skating at this point can help bring a more you know sustainable growth to skating in general mm -hmm. i love that i love that um it's a very first of all it's very well thought out and you're a great storyteller and um i just i just love hearing your perspective on everything but yeah i think um it's like it sounds very selfless and like very contributing and like i feel like that's People who have been in blading so long, they have this kind of sense of responsibility where they just want to see it be okay and see it be healthy, at least in the future at some point. Um, there were a lot of things I wanted to touch on. Uh, I wanted to mention you were going on your thing quickly. I don't want to, I don't want to like, I'm not trying to stick it to you, but are you saying you can't have fun on like a mini ramp? 
It's not. It's not fun. No, for you. <laughs> no. They're pretty I, fun, man. This blew your mind. <laughs> no, so that's not true. Like, if we get into a mini ramp session and we go to a park and we're actually doing a mini ramp session, yeah, mm -hmm. I actually, I, I have a lot of fun. But that's because I think of RSA, the Far Side Skate Park. That's that's. You know, it's funny because, like you said, you you get on these things, you say a lot of shit, you end up saying stupid shit. But no. I, I, I you guess saying I stupid like, shit. I don't. I can't say that I don't enjoy it because that's where Richard and I learned half of our tricks, half of our switch ups. Right. We learned on coping. I'm actually a really good mini ramp skater when it comes to coping, but mm -hmm. because I. It's fun because I mean I don't know because I guess I grew up in that environment in Wyoming and I just really never had practice on ramps that there's there's a piece of me that just like when I'm skating it I'm not as comfortable right and it doesn't it's tough to say it's like it's like eating something that you don't enjoy like yeah it's gonna it's gonna fill you up but you're not like. But it's not what it. you're looking for. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, so like, <laughs> a slice of pizza is like an alley -oop topsail on a 25 stair down. But <laughs> right. like, but when I go, like, it's like eating health food when I go to the skate park. You know, it's all in good fun for everybody that's there. But at the end of the day, it didn't. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I, I think um, it's the hardest part about it is here. This is the reality. I, I like when I go there and I skate with kids. But you're never going to see me go to a skate park on my own. When I'm on my own right now and I go skating, I actually go skate a down rail. I don't film it, but I go and skate a down rail by myself. But that's like, that's the kind of skating that I, I like. And Sick. most people I think would be like, why are you going to go kill yourself right now? I mean, you'd trip on some of the things that I'm filming for my VOD. I mean, I'll like... I'm like hanging out, I'm cleaning up, I go pick my daughter up from school and then like Richard's got an hour and then we go and do some crazy stunt. You know, like it's a it's a different world, but my body enjoys that. And I've at, I'm at a point where I, I posted about it today. Like it's been a process trying to get back on my skates. I mean, I tore my bicep tendon, I tore my MCL and dislocated my knee. I went through all these other injuries and just getting beat to shit in all of it. I just keep learning another step that I have to take care of myself. So I tore my bicep tendon and it made me realize that I need to lose weight. So then I lost 30 pounds in like 40 days. And then I thought I was wow. good to go. And I was like, all right, I'm good to go. I lost all this weight. I detoxed like crazy. I lost so much weight. I feel invincible. Then I go skating and like, I slip on the park, dusty park, skate park. Another reason why I don't like skate parks, they're always dusty and you eat shit and you, and my <laughs> knees are weak. So like if I slip on a skate park, there's a good chance my knee's going to dislocate. So that's exactly what happened. So then I had to work on that. And then I realized, okay, so my knee popped out. Even though I lost weight, I'm not in shape. So now I got to get in shape, like actually physically strong. And then... I'm skating and I think, okay, I'm physically strong now. I'm good to go. But then I try some tricks that are technically pressing for me. And I have these nerves in my head that make me feel like, oh man, like people want to see me skate. And I mean, I was excited that people were happy to see me skate, but I thought I really want them to see what I know I can do. So then I'd be skating and I input some of that into my head and then I'd feel like I couldn't do something and I wasn't ready to do it. But then I pushed myself to do it. And then I would eat shit and injure myself and have to take like four or five days off or a week off to like barely hold a spoon because I pretty much fractured my hand. And then I'm like, I knew that that injury came about because I was pressuring myself to do something that wasn't true to what I wanted. So then I had to take a moment to meditate on that and then realize what the next step was when I went and skated. So then eventually it finally clicked and like I realized what I wanted to do with skating and it wasn't, I didn't want to come in and take over anything. I didn't want to come in and start a company. I, I didn't want to come in and, and just be this guy that was back. 
I wanted to actually skate the way I like to. And so that takes doing rehab like two to three hours a day. Like I'm up at five and I'm stretching and then I'm doing this. Then I'm stretching again in the middle of the day that I'm doing some therapy at night. I've got a massage gun. I've got a foam core roller. I'm doing like exercises and stretches that are particular to the injuries that I'm taking on daily. And so like when people are like, how are you doing it? How are you still skating? And how are you, how are you putting out like these one day edits that are like four or five bangers that nobody wants to do. And then you skate three days later. And I'm thinking like, if only they knew, if only they knew how I'm limping into my house, I'm like, can't hold something. I can't do something. I'm feeling like sharp pains from every which way I'm like, I mean, at that time, you guys remember those days where you're showering and like water's hitting a spot that's just road oh, yeah. rash yeah. and you can't thing. And then you go to like grab a bottle and you realize your wrist is sprained. And then like, you're like, oh my God. I mean, I've done it all. I you remember I skated in Seattle. I broke my finger through the meat and I reset it and then skated the rest of the contest and won it. You know, I, I've like, I was doing so, having so many injuries, but it was, uh, it you got a bad on a Bashi Pope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bashi Pope one was bad because I literally tore my PCL and my LCL and like my calf muscle when I hit and collided. And so when I went back up and I rode up and I was like, oh, my God, like everybody's expecting me to do this trick. Well, I wanted to do it. But now this comes to the comment I made. I really do enjoy doing tricks that get people juiced. It's fine. Like right. maybe some people don't care about others watching them. I legitimately love to do a trick that makes everybody excited. I Get mean, that energy. Yeah. I, I, it's like, it's like being a rock star or something. And yeah, like, yeah, doing, yeah. you know, like it's really cool. That's your time and blading to just put smiles on kids faces. And at the end of the day to really inspire some of these people, because <laughs> the fact is, is, not everybody's at our level of skating and we've worked really hard to get where we are. So when you're in that moment, you know, when I was at that Bashi Pope thing, I thought I skated that whole contest. I never even thought I was going to place. I was just having fun. I never for one minute thought I was even going to place. And then when it came to that last thing, I'm like, oh, I better do one trick for the crowd that I know I can do that probably nobody's going to want to try. Now, grinding that box and gapping like 12 feet to that ledge was not easy. And the re reason is because like I had to skate fast enough to where how I fell was the inevitable death. Like I thought, okay, as long as I don't slip off this box and collide into that ledge. And the very first try I went for it, I slipped and I slid and then I double shinned the ledge. Nobody really saw that one because it happened so quick, but both of my legs were dead. And I was like, oh my God, man, this is parted. Both my uh, legs are dead and I haven't even tried the trick. Hmm. So then when I went for it and I like the rail, I think broke on the time that I actually did that. So like I broke the little box rail when I hit the sole and it kind of threw my weight off or it must have been broken already at that point. But the, my weight was off and I couldn't correct it. I'm telling you. It's in slow mo, or what you guys probably saw online, but I don't know if you remember seeing it and if you were there in person to watch it. But that was terrible. And so when I went up and I was thinking to try it again, as soon as I straightened my leg, and I'm like, okay, my leg's good, it just went back, and I felt it go to dislocate backwards, like my ACL was torn. And I'm like, oh no. So then, like, I was like, all right, I'm going to keep squatted. Because if I'm squatted, it's not going to try to break backwards. But then, like, I went to turn in my skates and my knee was like, and it tried to try going sideways. And I just was like, all right. And I took all my energy in and just said, all right, these guys have got one more of these tries. And I, and I just went, like, with all my might. And I'm pretty sure I didn't land it. And... I that's I I didn't land it on that one. And when I came off, I tried gapping to it and I didn't make it all the way. 
my knee was just like, bah, bah. I could feel it going sideways. And I was like, oh my God, I don't think I can do this again. And so I was pretty much going to give up. But then I went all the way back and I went all the way back up. And I think, I can't remember if Chris Edwards was there or somebody, but they gave me some juice and some props. And then I just took another deep breath in and focused. And I thought, just balance, just be as balanced as you can. And I, I did it and I landed it. And I'll tell you what, when I got to that ledge and I actually held the soul grind on that ledge, I was so fucking happy because I, I was not going to try that again. But um, that was that was a feat in itself. That's for sure. That was that was quite the feat. But all of these injuries, the point being is they all brought me to an understanding of my body, understanding of myself. And they remind me consistently that I need to take care of myself. So I welcome the injury because it's it's something that not only makes me feel more alive, but it gives me perspective on what I'm lacking in my day to day. And so it, it puts me in a space where I can actually focus on myself. And, and that's what I think we all need to do. We need to give ourselves a little bit more time in the day. We tend to give most of our hours to somebody else who's going to pay us. Then we give a lot of our time to our friends and family, but there's not much time for ourselves. And you have to, whether that means waking up early in the morning or staying up late, you have to find time to invest in, in yourself. And that actually, and that brings me to the the one trick a day that I do with Richard and Tom. You know, we, it's it's really about that mantra. Like you got to just get out there and do one thing for yourself daily because when you when you do that, you you carry that success, that feeling of success from whether it's landing a trick that you wanted to try or just simply getting out there and just doing something. Maybe you've just been lazy as shit or too busy. But once you get out there and do that, you feel that success and it carries with you day to day. And so one trick a day helps bring that presence, bring that emotion and and just I think it's a it's a philosophy that we hope to integrate into the community. And we're going to be doing more skate park visits. We're going to be doing more giveaways, anything we can to just try to build up the older community and truly bring in the younger community and give people a chance to either be seen like with what you guys do or heard. And just and it's it's something that I'm glad Richard and Tom had started it because it it fit into my mentality and what I plan to do. So it's, it's been a lot of fun and I'm, I'm glad that I'm a part of it and, and it's keeping me healthy. Yeah. So. Those one trick of days are super sick. Uh, the way, even though that you and Richard and are like older generation, you know, quote unquote, they're put together extremely well and very, very 2021, 2022, like they're very trendy style editing on YouTube and stuff like that. And I feel like that would get a lot of newer skaters in it too, even though that's kind of how you were talking before, how you want the newer generation to come in and stuff and, and take over and have a future in the sport. So even though yeah. you guys are, aren't from the newer generation, those videos that you and Richard are putting out, uh, they just put together really well in the more modern way that I think is more appealing to the younger crowd. Yeah, that's a lot of credit to Richard. I mean, Richard, when I first started skating too, he was my Instagram coach. You know, of course, <laughs> I ended up taking off on my own pattern of how I wanted to do things. But he's been a constant motivator in that. He's the kind of guy that will force feed you how you need to do something, you know, and, and be like, bro, are you kidding me? you got to do it like this and do it like this. What is wrong with you? <laughs> and like eventually the best part about him pushing all that onto you is once you start putting in work and he sees it he's the first person to call you and bro be like bro what i tell you that's it man that's it and like he'll really show you love and so he's helped me to keep my page kind of fresh and i i agree with you wholeheartedly he edits those and puts them together really well and there's a lot of fun stuff. I, we hope to collab with you guys. We got a lot of fun stuff ahead of us that we plan to do. There's even a, a, a skate on this Sunday that we're doing at Houghton Skate Park. And I think you've got Nickel and Dime that's going to be showing up. And uh, I think you've got Mike Obidoza. I think he might even be cooking, making some tacos. So it's going to be it's going to be pretty good. So Fish, if you're around, you should try to come come link up. Yeah, I, I heard about that. I'll be there for sure. Yeah.
It'd be good stuff. I mean, these are the kind of things that I think us being here is what we can do. You know, we really got to bring the community together. Like it's us. We're like the, we're the low key ambassadors. Yeah. We may not be the faces anymore, but we are ambassadors for the sport and right. we have a chance. We have a chance to bring not only history, but uh, just, I guess there's so much character that we can bring to the sport, but more than anything, it's the passion, right? Like uh, Austin said it, you know, us in our, like there's so much passion in this sport and like desire to bring one another up. But I think us at our age, you know, whether some of us are fathers or, or just in established careers now to like, we have a lot that we can bring to the plate and try to help bring blading up in the way that I think it deserves. I think it needs a little more limelight enough to where we're traveling the world and we're all having great tours together and having fun. I mean, I would love to be at my age, but be included on a tour where we're out there and we're shredding with people and we're just bringing the sport to more people. And I think there's that room of opportunity is there. It's easy for you to become pessimistic and say, no, nah, blading's not going to grow. Blading's not going to do this. But ironically, when I get like I'm not in any way like some of the other skaters on Instagram that have a lot more followers. But when you know when I'm getting 50,000, 60,000, 80,000 views or 125,000 views on a on a reel, I don't think all those people are rollerbladers. And it's good to put it in front of people because I can say since I've started skating, I've gotten probably 3 BMX riders that have bought rollerbladers and another two skateboarders and then maybe three scooter riders. It's not that much, but these are people that bought rollerblades with the intention to do aggressive skating and to know that I've got maybe eight or nine kids on skates this day that I've communicated with. It's a good feeling, you know, it's it's small in the scale of what you want to see rollerblading do. But um, I didn't it wasn't my primary focus to do that. Those were just people that saw my clips online and they were motivated by it, motivated by the things that I said and they decided to start following me and they picked up rollerblades. And that's a pretty good feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, when you came back, like, let's talk about the comeback a little bit because you came back, you got skater of the year, one magazine. Congratulations, by the way. Um, I, I think a lot of people would agree that you got comeback of the year. And, um, what, what was it like, uh, by building like how did you go about building everything on instagram because i remember when you came back you had like uh like uh, just a few thousand followers and you got and you yeah. set up super yeah. fast and and you just know. like but like obviously you're putting out great content <laughs> but um it was I uh think... it was a really big year for you like every, and everything like that so yeah i, yeah, I got it almost i got it up to you know my instagram i've actually for the last few months have really kind of Nah, I kind of died out a little bit and I can get into that actually now and tell you guys why. But first, I'll tell you the the story of it and how I got it to grow at least. You know, I work now in production. I, I, I work as a, a live events video engineer. I do everything from directing to engineering. It's a very broad title because there's a lot that I do in that space. But the point is, is I work I'm usually under a non-disclosure agreement and I get to see quite a few interesting presentations and I get to see the top companies talk about ways in which they can build and grow and how they can connect. So I, I've got a, a decent sense of the business acumen that it takes for that, but not to say that I applied that to Instagram, but what I did do was I utilized some of the information that Richard had given me on how things were going and how you could do reels and posts and stuff. And it, it became, it became kind of like a fun game instead of wanting to post things that actually vibed with my style or who it is I was or what I wanted. I just started having fun with, okay, this might be a viral song or something annoying. The sound might not be anything that I really want, but I'm going to test it and I'm going to test the water because if you look at Instagram and you look at social media or you just take anybody today, 
we're living in like a seven second world, if that. I mean, people, they've got like five, six seconds of attention span before they've moved on and they've decided that they don't want to give you any more of their time. And so at this point, I was like, well, I know I can post something that if it makes me proud and it vibes with my style, there's a good chance that the core market's going to enjoy it. But it might not hit or be caught or respected by the masses. And so instead of like being concerned about the core market or being concerned about my image, I would really just started posting. Posting so much so that I'm sure I've made it to Blade Hate pages or Facebook hate pages, whatever they are. I don't pay attention to any of it, but I have people chime in and tell me, oh, somebody was saying something about you. And I'm like, that's great. I'll do souls till the day I die. I really don't care. For me, it's like, I'm going to post what I can and repost what I can if I feel there's a good chance that it's going to be seen by new people. Because you post something, it gets 10,000 views, 20,000 views. But just because you post that same clip again and you're going to have people in the core industry that are tired of seeing it, it doesn't matter. If I get 25 comments from people that are like, holy shit, what was this? That means 25 people now saw it that didn't. So if you're looking at it from a numbers standpoint, what are we looking to do? Are we looking to maintain images for the core industry that is barely able to pay us the money we deserve? Or do we want to grow that core market just enough to where we can all actually post and maybe have people filming us instead of us filming ourselves? Like we need to get to a state where this sport is great and there are great people in it and there's there the stunts that we do, the level of skating, the style that it's gotten to. It is time for us to be brought into a professional market where we're represented and we're seen by others. And so I'm just playing around with Instagram and have been. And now I got it to a point where I get these $800 a month bonuses. And so half the time I'm reposting content, I don't really care if people are worried about it because if I get 30,000 views on that and I post another one, another one, there's a chance that I'm gonna make four to 500, six, 700, 800 bucks that month on Instagram. And that's just money that I can drive into giveaways or traveling for skating. So anytime I've gotten money from Instagram, I just put it into an account that I utilize for traveling for skating. And I've utilized it to send skates to Poland or send skates to Brazil or do whatever. You know, I've done I've done a few giveaways on my own, not as many as I'd like, but um, in general, like there's a lot of opportunity for us. And I feel like- Wait, how are you getting money from skating? Apart from Instagram, know, by the way. Wait. I, I didn't even know you can get money on Instagram. Yeah, what are you talking you about on here? Instagram? I've been getting paid from Instagram for like six months now. Every you... month I get like 400, 600, 700, 300. How? For views? Because I, because I get bonuses. They offer oh, me. Oh, that's the bonuses. They Like sometimes at one point they offered me 800 bucks. It was like I had to go live for 15 minutes for one week. And then if I went live again, for 15 minutes the next or 15 or 30 minutes the next week subsequent week then i got the first week was like 150 then the next week was 250 then it's like 350 they uh, increased it but then it got into real bonuses so now i get these real bonuses where like i have to get 1.5 or 1.7 million views and then i'll make a thousand dollars you know so i did the math on it one month and i was like okay if I post two reels a day and I get on average, you know, 35,000 views per reel, then in a 30 day time span, I should be able to hit 1.5 million or whatever, right? And so that's what I started doing, just doing two reels a day with the intention. And so then if some of them get to 50,000 or some of them get to 20,000, I create an, uh, an, an average that puts me at my bonus. And so, I, and, and I found out soon into that, like most skaters don't have bonuses on Instagram. And I'm like, OK, so here's step one. I just started skating, but I'm teaching people that have much greater Instagram pages how to make money on Instagram. And it's confusing. Made me want to start a consulting business, made me want to start a management business, 
made me want to start a an agency for skating because I feel like so many skaters are just underrepresented. They're not they're not aware of where the opportunities are. They're not aware of where money is. And it's it's interesting that you don't see more rollerbladers trying to carry each other to success. A lot of skaters are on Instagram and they only want to post themselves and they're only focused on their own image or their own merchandise or their own product, like their own ability. And it's really working against us as a whole. We have a chance to carry each other. So I'm getting an $800 bonus. So if every one of my friends on Instagram sent or reposted my post or shared my post and it gets to 60,000 views and they did that every post that I put, I mean, at some point I've had ideas like, do I tell these people that I'm going to make this post and I want everybody to post because if I get my $800 bonus, then I'll turn it into a giveaway for all of them. It's interesting that I'm like, I've found myself in a duality where like, I don't want to have to ask people for that because they will perceive it as me trying to become popular. But in my mind, I'm thinking, why wouldn't we all share everything we can so that all of us can get to that next level? But there needs to be some intention behind it. So like, I almost started a uh, GoFundMe to where I could get people to contribute to helping me travel. And I was going to set up tiers to where they could help me, like whatever countries donate more, that I will go to that country and pick a few cities. Of course, I didn't plan on getting all the money from them, but I'd throw my own in. But these are ideas that I was coming up with, but I didn't lock in on any of them because there were so many other projects and so many things that I was working on that I just decided I don't want to ask the community for a handout. I'd rather find ways to make my money and just give back as much as I can. But still, the process of supporting one another is missing, and I think we need to think in a more business fashion than being so concerned about our look or our image. It's great. We can maintain our image for the core and stay in that space, but we need to grow as a whole. So if we can figure out how we can do that together, which is another reason why I'm doing this. Like I'm, I'm here with you guys because I know it's, it's important for the industry. It's important to take this time to talk about these things and especially on your platform because you're a staple for the industry and i know that at some point as rollerblading grows you guys will become the shit you guys will be the channel that everybody wants to watch and then it'll be this awesome thing where you've got all these episodes where people can actually catch up to rollerblading and see where it is so you've created a platform for once we are being seen by the masses we have a way for our story to be told and it's great, you know, and I'm, I'm glad to be here doing it. Awesome, man. Holy moly. You were just spitting some facts and knowledge right there. Yeah. I, I always saw the bonuses thing, too, and I just never clicked on it on Instagram. But I feel like a lot of people do share. Like, I feel like now more than ever, as a community, we are helping each other more than ever. I always see constantly on people's stories, everyone sharing other people's reels nonstop. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, for it's, sure. It's, it's just everyone just hyping each other up and, and spreading the love. I think I see that now by far more than ever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to say we don't do it, but I definitely think that we could find a way to maybe be more methodical about it, right? Like, I mean... There's, I have some business ideas that I am putting into action right now that I don't want to talk about too much because I don't want to spoil it. But without a doubt, I think there's a there's a, a way in which us, some of the people that are at the top of the market, some of the pro skaters, some of the up and comers, that we can open up a dialogue that maybe we have monthly, that we get into a space where we can communicate with each other on ways in which we can move forward in the industry. So we understand what projects are going on. So maybe we can assist each other and communicate on ways we can line up and connect dots, whether it's with photographers, travel, food, who knows. But there are so ways that I think, there are ways that I think us as a community are still kind of just leaning on our connections versus having a platform in which we can guaranteed reach out to and get those answers and get that assistance so there's a few things that i'd like to see you know brought into the space into the industry and hopefully i can be one of the guys that you know helps bring that but i don't see it as something being me 
I might just be a voice that helps get it started, you know, something that gets us in that point where, I mean, for instance, I work in production, right? So I, I, I'm engineering and I'm working on high level systems and I'm putting together these complex systems that had had some firmware update or some software update. Well, how do you get past that? You get past that by calling on somebody that you know that might have seen that issue or might be able to do it. You're not on YouTube. You don't call the company that manufactures the gear. Maybe at worst case, but the first call you make is to somebody who's notable, that's a friend of yours that can help you out. And so I think we need to, we just need to find as many ways as we can to start creating a cohesive space for rollerblading where we are there to support one another. So yeah, you're right. We're posting, we're doing that stuff and there's some of that there, but we haven't taken it to the level that we can, where we really see the fruit of our efforts in edifying one another. So I think I, it's just a process. It's not, it's easier said than done, but at the same rate, here we are, we're doing exactly what I'm talking about. And it's a start, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, conversations like this are always beneficial to everybody too. everyone listening, everybody's perspective or perspective, someone else's uh, perspective. I see Richard's hyping it up in the chat also. So uh, I, we're all on the right chat. Where do we find? <laughs> I think you just have to open up the YouTube video maybe on the side. Oh, okay. Yeah, do I'm it. Just Let's do it right now. Let's open up the YouTube chat. We get another view on the video. That means we go better better in the algorithm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Somebody help each other. <laughs> we try to help each what other is, grow. What is, what's the YouTube link? Oh, wait. What is this? <laughs> this guy's surfing the web right now. Yeah, look at this. Now it says, <laughs> how do I find this Jump Street thing? Let's get serious here. <laughs> this guy's going to watch himself. Yeah. We got 166 people in the chat watching live. This is great. It's about to be yeah. podcast inception right now with uh Oh, look Demetrius. at this. Live now. Live now. Yeah. Do it. Click it. Click the like button. I, and subscribe. Right now. That must mean you guys are talking. You guys making ad money? Yeah, that's like a quarter of a penny right there for us. <laughs> <laughs> you just got a quarter. All right, yes. Yeah. We, we got to learn some of your techniques. <laughs> I think... Uh, I think I think in a little bit uh, we should because I think you seem like grow you can grow on ideas really well. And we have some Patreon questions and we have some super chat questions and to everyone yeah, watching live. Yeah, please. I I've been reaming everybody with my long winded talk. So please. no, I love it. It's incredible. But um, just so everyone who's watching live knows, we give half of our super chats to our guest. So just know that uh, your super chats are pr prioritized. And then if we have time after the Patreon questions and after the Super Chat questions, we will be taking some other questions if we have time. But we do have a lot of Super Chat questions, so it might not be able to. But hang tight anyway, because there are some good, good questions ahead. Um, before we get into our Super Chat questions, um, Austin, do you have any, do you have any last things? Um I kind of there is a topic I want to talk about, but some of the uh, Patreon questions are similar, so I figured we just bundle okay. it up all together. Um, should we get into the Patreon stuff then? I think so. Are you ready, Demetrius? Yeah, yeah, man. I'm always ready. For ready. Some questions. So we have a few uh, Patreon questions. Um, if you're not a Patreon member, please consider joining. Link in the description of the YouTube channel. Uh, but Jackie Ong, as well as Danny Keyblade, had similar questions. So I'll just bundle it kind of into one. Jackie asked, do you go to the gym and how do you heal if your knees are sore? And Danny says, on your Instagram, you share some parts of your journey to becoming healthier. Would you tell us more about your diet, workout schedule, and rest the recovery methods that have worked best for you? So pretty much just like a health topic. Wow. All right. Let's get serious. Someone's happy now. <laughs> this is very important too. This is also helping us as a community grow all of these conversations as well because many of us now are 30s plus, so it definitely helps us all out. You know, I'm happy that that was asked because a part of this journey back to skating, one of the things that motivated me the most was as I was talking about what I was doing to get healthy, I ended up with a really large amount of skaters, dads, people asking me tips on fitness, on health. And I spent, I can't even say how many hours I spent last year giving people books about 
what they can do step by step approaching every each week the second week the third week and so i you know i i prayed to become organized enough <laughs> to get myself in a space where i can really start driving health content online to help everybody but i was always a little too shy because i know i i knew it wasn't refined enough right but i realized later that that's really not helpful i could be that fitness guy online that everybody watches that's great but i want to it's more important for me to just be transparent and tell you exactly how it is and so for the for the knee question and for what it comes to getting my knees healthy when they're sore and the gym i don't go to the gym i've never been a gym guy i do a um I mean, God, let me, I, you know what? We're on this. Might as well do this the right way. Let me just, let's see. So what I do, right, is in the mornings, first thing I get out of bed and I'll hold a plank, right? I'll hold a plank. I'll do some push-ups, And then the first thing I get into is like a Pilates pose. And I, I go nice and low and I sit there and I do arm circles and I hold it and I go up to the top. I do about two to three minutes in the morning and I do about two to three minutes in the night. That's how I build my muscle memory to where it's like brushing your teeth and it jump starts your metabolism. It keeps you in a point where your body is always ready to be active because you're actually addressing those muscles, your core muscles, and you're just keeping yourself going. That's what I, that's my gym. Now I have like some eight pound weights I have a little pull-up bar and a few other things that I incorporate. But in reality, majority of what I do is just on the ground and is with just, just very, very minimal weight. I do have some of those bands where you have the bands because I'm, I'm big into resistance. So I do resistance things, but still most of it all just in my room on the floor. I'm not... I've never, I realized when I went to the gym, I'd get too bulky and that weight would actually hurt me when I skated. You need to be a little bit lighter on your body. So I'm not too big on the gyms because I end up building muscles that aren't pertinent to rollerblading. So doing some of those, focusing on my core and then essentially skating, that's about it. Um, knee health though. My knees were so bad. I've had a re full reconstructive surgery on my right knee so it's not in a in a happy place if you guys heard it when i bend down it just grinds and pops it's terrible Ugh. Um, it's it's really a bad situation i've got a cadaver ligament and for the longest time i couldn't do anything that's one of the reasons why i kind of stopped skating you know aside from pulling out of skating so that i could actually focus on my uh finances because i had a daughter on the way I also was going through tremendous amount of swelling and the, the inflammation in my knee made it near impossible to even just stand on my knee all day long. So losing the weight and getting my gut right and the gut health was a really important factor because immediately the inflammation in my body went down. So now tying into the next question that was asked about what do I do for general health? I juice veggies daily and that's primarily celery and I'll do beets and like lemon and some ginger. Sometimes I get into carrots and some other things, but I try to avoid things that have too much sugar in them because if I'm going to focus on my gut, I'm doing anything I can to reduce the sugars in my gut because it feeds the yeast and the candida, which then ends up making you crave all the shit that you don't need. So once you get rid of that, the inflammation in your body really kind of picks up and it's easy for you to shed weight if you have it. But juicing is a big thing. I'm big on my vitamins. Should I got, I have some here, you know, I've got, I take whole food vitamins. I even take this alpha brain stuff, even though Joe Rogan talks about it. I will say from a cognitive standpoint, there are certain products that you can put into your body that if your gut's healthy, you will actually feel the benefits of those herbs and supplements. So I do, I'll do some posts instead of showing you guys everything to try to give you, a, I actually already had filmed, I just have chopped them up, I just haven't posted them yet, but 
I'll do some stuff soon so that you can get an idea into some of the vitamins and nutrients that I take. But I will say this, if anybody wants a good breakfast, all you need is some, uh, some oats, do some oats with some hot water, throw a couple tablespoons of some hemp hearts on there, get some almond butter, do a tablespoon of almond butter, then I'll do a, a small spoon of some Manuka honey. I mean, I get one that's pretty expensive. This is like 65 bucks a jar. There's some that are even more, but Manuka honey is good. It's got a lot of benefits in there, a lot more so than a regular honey. It's got antiviral and a lot of nutrition in there. So take a look. You can get some information online. But I'll do oats, honey, almond butter, some hemp hearts, and some goji berries. Bang. That's your breakfast. You get that. That's all you really need. You don't need anything else. I do a juice, some celery, and some beets and lemon. That'll get me through an entire day if I was actually detoxing and I didn't need to do it and I wasn't going to eat. And at some point in the day, I may be snacking on things like celery and like some veggies, raw broccoli. I'll do like steamed broccoli and spinach with olive oil and lemon. There's, there's different things you can do, but I want to say this. I don't believe in diets and I don't believe in believing that you can actually get to the gym on time. There are those out there that stay on point and they can actually follow getting to a gym three times a week. There are those people that can do that. I have a, a, a motto where it's trust and failure. I fully believe that failure is your best friend and it's something that you're going to learn throughout anything. And anything that you try in life, you're going to fail at. And so the sooner you realize that failure is what helps you to learn and become better at something, then you just need to understand how to work with it. So with the diet, I'm not a perfect eater. There'll be days where I'm driving up north and I see a Wendy's and I buy two combos because I'm that hungry. Hmm. But then I next thing you know i'm juicing and i'm doing this for these days but the the pattern would be to figure out where your body is how your body reacts to foods and so it takes a boot camp on your gut to get to that point so instead of like doing a diet or starting some workout regimen what i did and i'm not telling anybody or suggesting or saying this is what you're gonna do and you're gonna have some tremendous results but what I did was I cleaned my gut out where I did juicing strictly celery and lemon and water and broth soups and steamed vegetables. I did that about for a solid week. Now, I did the one thing that nobody's comfortable talking about or doing, and I went and saw a hydrocolon therapist. Yeah, it's, it's hard for most men to ever imagine doing, but it's the fact. It doesn't matter if you're if you're trying to detox, you're going to dehydrate your gut and you're going to dehydrate your colon. So I knew I was going to reset my gut, but I didn't want to flush everything out and leave myself with some other issues. So I did a process of veggies and juicing, and then I hydrocolon therapy session, veggies and juicing, and did another one. I think I ended up doing three full sessions, and that was a process of how I lost 30 pounds in 40 days. It was doing an intensive boot camp on my gut. And then from there, I have, you know, I'm eating shabu shabu. I have salmon. I have steak. I eat, I eat well. I'm not eating raw foods. I'm not being just like this or I'm not counting calories. I just know that if I eat a steak and I eat some heavy carbs, that that's that means the next few days I better be rollerblading and I better be doing something active. And I should probably drink juice in the morning and try to juice as much as I can to help flush everything out. So from a health standpoint, I believe just it's important to get out as much as it is that you take in. So find things that you enjoy that are healthy and try to, in, you know, incrementally bring those into your diet. But eventually, if you're going to really jumpstart your health, you should just reset your gut. And then you can go through failing and doing everything from there on out. We're never going to be perfect, but we just have to give it a go. And I mean, even right now, I'm coming off the holidays. And you guys haven't seen me posting on Instagram that much. And that's because 
I haven't had a day off since January 18th. I've been working in production doing 10 to 15, 16 hour days. I've been fortunate to have some paid days off, but I haven't actually had a day off. Like today at my home, this day was my first day off. And ironically, I'm here on this chat. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> but uh, I mean, health is health is what we make of it. And so we got to put in the effort and we just got to go for it. So stand by. I'll get you guys some more posts about my vitamins and some of my more some of the processes. And you'll be seeing me in much better shape over the course of these next few months because I'm skating right now and filming for my VOD and it's taking a lot and so that's what i'm doing right now i'm strength training and i'm building up for some of these stunts that i have on the storyboard so Ooh. sick that was the most informative health discussion we've ever had on the show <laughs> so thank you for sharing all that with us yeah i figured if people want to rewatch it they can hear it right? of course they i'm going to rewatch it they could rewind that and get a, a little quick snippet on what they need to do to reset. And please DM me. I've been really bad about that. I'm going to set up an email that people can respond or send me questions direct to because I'm tired of just missing DMs. I want to like help people out. But uh, whether it's through your guys' chat and you let me know or however, if anybody asks you any questions in your Patreon, I'll follow up with them and try to give them even a one on one if they want it. So, yeah, ask questions in the, if you have any com uh, questions, ask them in the chat and maybe you could check them out later on in the next day or two. Yeah, for sure. Uh, moving on to another Patreon question we have from Bobby White, who says, You seem to really like those Killer Bee Thrones. Do you have any plans to try any different skates now that you're back? That's a deep question. Um, <laughs> Billy and I know that question all too well. We we bumped heads immediately when I came back because I when I came back, I couldn't imagine skating anything else other than the classic throne. And I immediately I reached out to to try to bring that skate back or bring something back. It wasn't short after that I found out that Billy was and it became a thing where I said some things that were misconstrued and I and I and I wasn't, you know, I, I had my intentions of doing so much that it took a moment for Billy and I to realize that I wasn't coming after his company. But I just love the classic throne so deeply that I, I had hopes to have done something with it. Um, I do love that skate and I have interestingly shaped large feet. My feet are like a size 12 and I'm riding a size 10 and a half classic throne. I don't, when I move to other skates, they become too big. They don't feel right. They're not tight enough on my foot. They're not this, they're not that. We all know the battle of skates and I've come to this very uniform way of how my, my pads, shock absorptions and my liner, and I'm just comfortable skating it. I've tried out the God skate and I like them. The FM threes, they're really nice. I think I just have to break them in if I'm going to get them to go. I'm waiting to get a pair of the Mesmers, but the I lagged on purchasing them when they came out. And I know Billy's distributing them to the masses that want them. So in good time, I'm sure I'll have a chance to try the Mesmers out. But it would be hard for me to move on to any other skate other than what I'm riding. And I have quite a few pairs of them, so I can I could ride them out for a, a while. I'm sure I could ride them out until I'm retired. But at the same rate, it, I, I don't I would like to skate a new skate that's on the market because I'd I'd like to be doing something on my rollerblades and able to promote something that can actually be sold to the market. Uh, Matthias and USD, who were always supporters of me, and I've always I've I've never had any problems. I had my words back in the day um, that got me in trouble plenty of times, but uh, I do respect Matthias a lot and what he does, and he did offer me uh, an All Star skate last year, and it would have actually come out this spring. I had bigger aspirations to do more and maybe I should have held those aspirations back if I would have understood where the industry was and I'd be lucky enough to have a skate now. But instead I, I kind of held true to what I want to do and what, where I want to grow. And so I've kind of held back on 
any sponsorships or any offers from anybody just because it's been it's been a dream of mine to have something that I owned or had something that I could put and contribute and put into the market. So I've been working towards that now, but a lot of it's shifted because I do see industries that need support more than a competitor. Um, so I've been in a torn mind as to what to do or how to release what I want to do, but I do have ideas. And so whether I join some team and try to bring those ideas to reality or if i do it on my own i'm yet to really be sure how that's going to play but one thing i'm sure of i'm not leaving anytime soon and you guys will be excited when you see what i'm doing right now on my skates so i would love to see you try the skates man one day that'd be sick yeah i mean i'm sure I mean, as long as, you know, there's a yellow one at some point. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have the only yellow skate? Well, I mean, there was like the fifth elements, I guess, back in you the know, day. You know, I dropped that yellow skate and it was way too bold for the market when it came out. Right. But like and then I my third pro skate was actually going to be a wood grain, either wood grain, like a woody or a marble. And I know Kenneth was probably depressed when i ended up pulling out last minute and just going with like a matte black skate but it was weird it was like i had this i had this emotion that overwhelmed me at the time that i was like i loved my yellow skate i fucking loved that skate it represented wu-tang it represented me it just looked good in my opinion it was flashy it did what i wanted it to do I, I was happy with the liners. Everything about it was great. The the logo that J.C. Rowe had designed with the B on it, with the blunt in his mouth. Mm. There was a lot. But the third skate, instead of it being a wood grain classic or like a marble, a black and gray marble, I ended up just going with black because I figured I always wanted a black pro skate. I just wanted a ninja out black, all black skate. And it was like a dream of mine to have that. And so instead of going with another crazy color like yellow or something that everybody was going to be like, oh, it's the banana blade or talk some kind of shit on. I decided I didn't want everybody saying, oh, first he's got a banana. Now he's got a woody skate. I said, it's a little too risky. Let me just go with my ninja black. I like that all blacked out. Like, And I'm happy with it. But looking back on it, I think it would have been kind of fun to have stuck with what we had designed because it would have been another crazy skate for its time nowadays i think you know skate companies have played with a little bit more of that and like you even see the them skates with the brain dead how they made it tie-dye and i laugh i'm like those are all the ideas that i had back in the day that i was trying to do but matthias kept telling me like nobody's going to buy this skate. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm like, ah, I don't know. I want it. I want it crazy. I still was happy about doing it. But so I went with, uh, I don't know. I went with black and, uh, but I, I do, I love the killer B skate. It's the yellow skates. It's always going to be my favorite. And if I ever, if I get another pro skate or a recognition or an all-star, some kind of skate, I'm sure it'll be a nod to my killer B. That would make sense, I think, in the most, the yellow. That's what you're known for, the iconic yellow skate. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next Patreon question we have, last Patreon question we have, uh, is from Brian Sparks, who, <laughs> as is a funny one, is asked, what is the smallest rail you grind to find enjoyable? Is there a lower limit <laughs> that just doesn't do it for you? I guess because you're known for just jumping on high shit. <laughs> um, can, you, can you skate P-rails and stuff, or... Like, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I did that. I did a P rail edit with Richard. What I do, I did like true top soul to outspin top soul on his little P rail at his house. Um, no, that's what we grew up skating practice rails. That's how Richard and I learned most of our tricks. My brother Andre and I, like, we learned a lot on practice rails. Um, I like, I don't mind skating low rails, but let's instead of talking about enjoyment, let's talk about risk. Let's talk about the reality here. So I try to explain this and I've gotten a few kids to understand this and I've watched them go for something that they were terrified of after I explained the physical safety of skating something tall. Now, when you skate something tall, 
and you're jumping up to that, when you miss a technical grind, if you've learned how to fall, then you can grab the rail. You can grab it. I completely can, agree with that. I always say the jerk, same thing. Right? So now what happens when I go and I try to do an alley fish brain or an alley top sole or a true spin top true top porn on some low rail and it sticks. Now I go flying and I've got four feet or five feet to fall until I fucking hit that rail or the ground. So I that's why I try to say I have a tremendous amount of respect for people that skate smaller stuff because it's just as dangerous. You just have to learn how to fall differently. And all my years, I learned how to fall on tall shit. And I enjoy skating it because I'm safer skating it. Yeah, if I fall on it in the wrong way, like most people do, it'll kill you. Some of these big drop ledges and stuff that are tall, it's definitely going to take you out. But I've learned how to skate in that environment, and it's not as scary for me. So I I enjoy it too. Like I said, it I know it puts a, a like what the fuck on somebody's face, and that's kind of fun for me. You know, I like to do that. Like at Boshi Pope, I alley top sold that tall wall. It's not really a ledge, but yep. it's like that wall ledge. And that I think I think for. A good amount of skaters that were there that were there to watch me they're gonna never forget that and they're always gonna skate next to that ledge and be like yo son you remember when d fucking ali top sold this ledge and like i enjoy that factor so i'm always gonna skate it but i there's um i'm trying to think about the lowest thing i like to skate is coping right i like to skate coping i like to skate mini ramps but when it comes to little rails I, it's tough to say i don't <laughs> I, I can't really answer that <laughs> i i mean but hey each his own right yeah all right we have a bunch of super chat questions next we're gonna read just the questions here we have from bombers arcade who asks Oh, he says, it's JT, John. How important is breathing and mental clarity when doing hammers, switch-ups, and disasters? Oh, huge. Um, breathing's a big thing. A lot of times you'll see me, I do this, like, I'll take my chest and I'll open up and I'm breathing and I'll, I'll bring my hands into my chest. I'm not praying, ever. What I'm really doing, and, and I believe wholeheartedly, is I, I like... I'm meditating and I'm pulling chi and I'm pulling energy from like the earth and just everything and breathing in. And as I'm, as I'm bringing down that I'm visualizing exactly what I'm going to do and landing that trick. And so breath is a huge factor. Sometimes if my breath isn't right, I know as soon as I've taken off and pushed to go, that my breathing patterns aren't correct and that I I'll actually still go for the trick, but knowing I'm not actually going to do it because I wasn't right in my breath, but I do it to overcome and keep in that mental state. I'm a cool thing happened to me last year where I actually like lost fear completely, like no fear when I was skating and I sounds crazy, but like, I actually am doing tricks and I'm not afraid of anything, but all I was battling was my fatigue, my injuries and my surroundings. So at the end all, if you're going to be able to do something and meditate and breathe and to get to that question, do yourself one big favor and that's remove fear. Envision yourself already on the ground having fallen and mad that you fell. And if you can do that, kind of like when you skate a competition and you fall and then you're angry. So then you get up and you start skating and you try to go back to it and you go all that. Well, don't fall and be hurt and angry at yourself. Just envision that process and already understand that that process is done. So now you just need to get to the trick and get it done the way you need to. 
So if you're filming, it doesn't matter if that's going to take you 30 tries of tries that people are like, man, this is taking them a lot of tries. I will take 30 tries of missing something in a way that I know is getting me prepared. And then once my breath is right and I'm ready before I've lost too much energy, then I put all of that into one and I give it all. But you have to remove fear as much as you can because fear will interject. It'll mess up your breathing patterns. And most importantly, it'll, it'll make you flinch at the wrong moment right when you're jumping to do a trick. And so you lose your style and your composure. So remove fear, focus on stance and applying all of your strength into that one trick. Because I think we know how to do the tricks, but we're not able to complete them because we're either not strong enough and or our stance is wrong. So if you can get your stance on point, which includes being flexible, right? Having a strong core. And then you can have your energy levels and have your breathing on point so you're not fatigued. So now with energy and with stance and no fear, you're destined for greatness. <laughs> <laughs> That's very well said. The me mental aspect is a huge part of skating. It's a huge part of anything that you do, but especially skating when you have like your health and body at risk, mental, mental part of it is huge. Yeah. Uh, next super chat from Juan Zavala who said, who asked, uh, your current favorite skater from the young slash new crowd, U.S. and international? I guess one of mm. each of you have. Um, gosh, that's that's a tough question. It's tough for me because I'm also bad with names. So like half of these kids I've been watching and I, I really couldn't even tell you their names. Um, I like... I like that, uh, from my perspective, I don't, I don't know if he's new, but that Savano Silla or whatever his name is, the guy from Russia that's on Rosie. The voice The voice in. The voice in. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I like that kid from a, a younger generation of things because I think he, you know, you see his Instagram, he does all kinds of crazy stuff in the snow. He does all this funny stuff. He's wild. He's strong. He's healthy. He takes care of himself. He skates really hard. I, I, I watched a lot of those Russian street contests online and he really just puts himself out there. Now that I'm not saying, I think there's other kids that have skating that I'm like really fond of comparative to Savonis. Savoisin. Savoisin. Um, but in general, he's got good tricks. He's a lot of fun to watch and he's really talented. So from that international space, I could say I really like I really like him. I I like that Bobby Sposos or the I forget, I don't even, I don't know any of these guys. <laughs> Bobby Spazov. Bobby, Bobby Spazov. Yeah. I like, I like his uh but he's an older guy, right? He's not even Yeah, not really. He's he's a newer generation, I would say. But he's like 32 or something. Like I don't think he's young by any means. But maybe maybe that's a secret that he, I shouldn't have let out to the masses. <laughs> But but he's got he's got such a refined style that I think is great. I mean, it's tough for me to pinpoint any one person because I think you see so much talent nowadays. You um, or you, I say, but Mesmer, I think like a lot of the guys on your team, they all hold a they hold a, a like a whole genre of style and a difference of skating that I think is tight with the young crowd. And I, I like what you're doing with your team, the entirety of it. Um, it's hard for me to pinpoint any one skater that I could say on the younger side that I really am like rooting for. But, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, you guys would have to point out some names for me. Like, I could sing rap songs and not know who the rapper was because I'm so bad at the name. <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I just know that. Those are, yeah. What was that? I would say those are good choices yeah, I regardless. Those are a few good names, yeah. Yeah, I would yeah. say so too. Uh, we have another super chat from Alan Bombersback who says, A plus storytelling, having I fun. 49 bucks. Sorry. <laughs> uh, having fun and building the community is, is king. Fondest memory from the trip to South America with Billy for the USD tour. 
Oh, see, I was wondering. We never even got into this. No. That's, oh, <laughs> Is this a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> no, it's great. I just, I never told that story, but I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll have another episode. Um, that, that trip, the fondest memory, I, I could, it's so tough to say. Was it the fact that Billy even made it to his plane and got there? Just like the process of me pretty much crying to the the what was it? I mean, what what Brazilian embassy? Really? Brazilian we embassy? Were in the embassy, and I like pretty much cried to this lady, telling her that I needed Billy's passport, like his ratted, tatted fucking passport, <laughs> and I needed another passport by like tomorrow, like and like who goes in New York? I could, I know Fish can remember this because there was like lines of people in here. Like, and I was just like waiting. Like, I don't care about those lines. There are kids waiting for this man to be in front of them. Their oh, dreams God. and their hopes. And like, I was no. like, in front of this woman selling her. And then, like, next thing you know, they like grab the passport and she's like, be here by 10 a.m. tomorrow. And I'm like, oh my God. And then I like took my airplane back to Cali and this is another fond memory, not necessarily the most motivational or inspirational for the kids, but, um, you know, I smoke weed. I'm fond of it. And there was no way I was going down to South America without some weed on me. So, of course, I, I you know, strapped up like this was funny, actually. I ground up like a good 28 or 30 grams of bud, right? Like a little over an ounce. And I vacuum sealed them and I straight taped them around my dick <laughs> and, and just had like this massive cock of weed. And I flew down to Columbia after the most incredible process of getting Jer Jero and Billy down there. They were already down there before I got there. And I arrived in Bogota. And there's like, you know, good amount of people, a truck and people and all these like waiting for us all excited or waiting for me all excited. And I get out of this, the airport and I, with it on me, all good and dandy. And I see Billy and Billy's got this like very casual, he's already being beat up by the South American culture of rapido, rapido. <laughs> you know, so he looks at me with this humble face and he's like, bro, we made it. And he gives me a hug and I look at him and I just in his ear and I'm like, bro, I've got an ounce of weed strapped to my dick. And he just picks <laughs> me up this, you know, Billy's relatively small compared to me. And he just picks me up like in the air and he's jumping like he's got me in his like I'm like way up high. He's picked me up by like my my legs and he's just jumping and I'm looking at all these kids and they're looking at me like. Jesus, they went from hugging to why are they so damn happy? And like, <laughs> oh my I'll, God. I'll never forget, like, I'll never forget how, like, I had these really cool cats take my bud to every country. They were driving it, like, from Colombia to Ecuador. That's right. To Ecuador, to all the, they brought my bud from Ecuador all the way to Chile. Damn. Ikike Chili, my weed showed up in Ikike Chili. Like, are you kidding me? Like, so that's a great memory. Is it like, yeah, is it the memory of the skating? No, but is it a memory? It's a cool memory. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cool memory. I think one of the best skating memories, though, I think we are in Colombia and Fish, he did this really cool thing, like on the side of this uh, bridge where he like dropped, like there was a kink, a drop kink rail. And he like skated and like dropped to the next section and then grinded the next part of the drop rail. And there was oh crowds. yeah, we had a really good session there. It was a drop yeah, and there rail. Was crowds of people, and then I hit like uh, soul the to whole soil. rail to soil, yeah. Rail, and it was like a massive drop kink. Yeah, um, I don't know, but to throw this one in there because I can't find this photo or the video clip for the life of me, but Fish will remember this. But I th I can't remember if it was in Medellin or if it was in Bogota, but I jumped over a bridge. Like, there was, like, a highway 
and I jumped over this bridge railing into this ditch, this water ditch. And there was like, I think this... that was Brazil. Oh yeah, you're right. It was in Brazil. Yeah. There was like a small sliver of concrete and then it yeah. went flat and then it went to down the rest. So you had to super land duper high a small slip sliver. And I think you ate shit and went into the ditch, the water. Didn't didn't you go into the ditch water? I think no, you did I, I, it. There was like you a didn't gap eat shit, but you the hit side, it. Yeah. You like, yeah. And you got all that grimy water on you. But all I know is I got this clip jumping over this railing and it was like chest high. And somehow I got like a foot high over it. And it was one of the sickest sequence shots that I've ever gotten in my life. Yeah, it's Jero honestly something it. that I'm trying to get till this day and find the photos. I'm trying to get Jeremy to do it, but I haven't connected enough to get him to do it. But like that was that was one of my favorite memories because we had such a good time in Sao Paulo. We just shredded downtown and just hit all these spots. And I mean, it was like it was heaven there. Jumping off the yeah. rocks with Carlos, like just into the beach. I mean, yeah, I, there's too many so memories from so South good. America yeah. to say one. We should do a, a Patreon video, just you two talking about South America stories. So oh, I feel like yeah. you could do like a whole episode on just that. We could. We honestly could. <laughs> we, we, could we could just revisit some of what Jero's videos were. We could even touch base yeah. on some. Yeah, just watch those videos. Oh, that'd be cool. They're all over YouTube also. Yeah. Uh, let's keep it moving with the Super Chest, though. We got more questions here for you, Demetrius. Uh, the next one is from JT, who asks... Does it ever worry you that the kind of skating you like to do isn't sustainable as you continue to get older? Are you going to hang the boots up when you can't do hammers? No, I don't. For one, I mean, it's tough to say. Like, when do you really have to stop doing hammers? That's like, I mean, shit, there's guys in their 60s that are doing the Ironman contest. So like, yeah, hammers can be dangerous, but let's just talk about what injuries I've sustained over this last year. I broke my finger and hand here, and it's the one thing that's hurting me the most. And how did I do it? I did it at the Blade Club, Blade Cup this year. My knee was, or my quad was like, I had torn or pulled some strand of muscle on my groin, and I couldn't skate Blade Cup, but I tried to. And while skating the smaller stuff there, I ended up falling and breaking my pinky. And it's the one thing that's hurting me the most. So, like, injury can happen in anything that we try. So it, are the hammers really more dangerous for me even as I get older? Or is it really, like, skating in a way that I don't know how to? So I think what's most difficult right now is wanting to progress because I genuinely want to show people some of the tricks that I know I can do, but I haven't been well practiced on. Those are difficult because it's easier to fall. So what people are seeing when they say hammers, yeah, I could probably do big soul transfer gap grinds until I'm 45 or 50. I don't think that's unrealistic. It's what's unrealistic is if I've given up on my health. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do that. But if I rewound six years ago, or I mean, not six, but let's say five, four years ago, I was so unhealthy <coughs> from my just working and engineering that I felt like I was 50. Now that I've got myself back in shape, I actually feel like I'm 23 again. My body feels strong enough to take falls. I'm strong. I'm fit. So our age is res respective to how well we're taking care of ourselves. And I, I don't necessarily believe in like we lose all the padding from our joints. No, you lose all this. The knees over toes guy online is a great way to say you could have your knees torn to shit, but you can get your knees back. You can do so many things. We're incredible beings. It's just up for us to try. But to answer your question directly... I'm going to continue to do hammers. Just wait until you see some of the ones that are in my VOD. Um, I think you'll probably shit yourself and say, okay. But um, at the end of the day, yes, they're dangerous, but I'm going to keep doing them as long as I can because that's how I like to skate. Um, and I'm sure I do like skating mini ramp. I'm sure at some point I'll probably cool it down a little bit and stick to just some more stuff. 
but that might not be until I'm in my, you know, mid forties or something. For now, I'm going to probably keep going hard. I have, my plan is to really push hard. And I, I really feel like I got a good solid five plus years of skating hard again in me and it sounds maybe unrealistic to some, but that's how I feel. And that's what I'm going to go for. You're skating like you have more than five years left in you. <laughs> as of I now. probably do, but I guess when I say five years, like I, 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 I actually have hopes and aspirations to do more in the sport and do less in my job. I have a good career where I make good money. I mean, I can, I can make over a few hundred thousand dollars a year if I'm working hard, but at this point, I'm willing to sacrifice those earnings in order to do what I love. And I know that it's not, and I got to say this, and this is not trying to sound selfless, but truthfully, there's nothing more motivating than being able to inspire others and give them motivation. And I've been in this job where I show up and I'm, they make jokes about me being a fruit booter, but in reality they have respects respect for me and nowadays they're just talking about me and showing other workers but i got to this point where i was just working and it and i know you guys know this there's nothing more defeating than knowing that we're like these talented athletes that should probably be wealthy and have made careers out of our wealth but we have to push boxes next to jack and jill mm -hmm. and here we are pushing a box next to jack and jill living a shit life without health insurance still what a great life, right? But I make good money now and I'm able to decide that I want to skate. So that's the best feeling. I now know I can travel myself to Europe. I can travel myself to these places and I can bring to that plate not the stress that we once traveled with our friends with where they were like, there's my per diem. I need my $35 to get by today. Like, I can now go into that environment and take everybody out to dinner and I can go into these spaces and give back to the community with maybe some merchandise and some product and with gatherings and be more, more professional about how to organize that. Right. And so I don't know. I'm excited about what's ahead for sure. Hell yeah. Uh, next super chat question we have from get rolling who says, love the intentionality of your actions. We also believe that we need to solidify our foundation as a community. What do you think is essential for it? Um, you know, it's tough to say because I don't want to shun any of the people that are doing what they're doing. I think that rollerblading has so many different aspects to it right now you have your robbie pitts you have the in the uh the bringing of like roller skating and rollerbladers together with like miguel camina and you know like all these different with estrogen and you have this blend that's happening and now you have like the resurgence of john bellino who brings hammers with the style that is of the new groups and so like I don't necessarily think the any of the ingredients are missing. I think what would probably help it most are business minds that start bringing it to the plate and bringing it to more plate, uh, more of the corporate world. Um, I know some skaters would say that they're against that because they don't want to turn us to that corporate. It's almost like radio killed the whatever, whatever it is that I'm so bad with music, right? Radio star. Or, <laughs> they yeah, kill the radio, radio star. star. <laughs> TV, TV killed the radio star. Like it's like that, but in the in the reality is, I feel like we're missing business minds that are bringing us up to that level. So now you do have like you have you guys with a, a podcast, and you're doing this, and you're bringing this to the plate. But is it being promoted in a way that it could grow? You guys are doing a great job, but these other avenues other people there's not many of us doing it right so i think we need to really like myself included i need my shit more on point i need to have a tour schedule where people can find out where i'm going to be skating and where i'm going to be instead of me just showing up randomly in last minute so like i want to become organized and i want to see what i can do to bring health and fitness to my page with motivation for the dads and this and, and everything that i want to do with my life 
and build that into a professional business that then when people go to look for me as a rollerblader, they see that I'm a professional all around. And I think that if there's something that rollerblading needs more of is just more of that, more consistent professionalism and or representation. And so, like I mentioned earlier, like I really would like to see like an agency in this sport or even myself start one. But the point is, I don't have those connections well enough yet to put people in front of the right people. But I do know enough to help. And which is why I was saying maybe I, I or whomever, we all can build up a, more of a platform in which we extend assistance to us all so that we can really make these events even larger than what they are instead of just having posts that say donate to this or the support or the you know a lot of these skate contests they put up their thing and they they garnish their sponsors <clears throat> but are we going to schools like we used to back in the day and doing setting up a ramp you see jared and grove uh doing that kind of stuff still he's doing a lot of those action sports and he's really in front of crowds but remember there was a time where we used to like go to schools we would we would go there to try to show action sports and like you go to south america and they would talk to the municipal to try to show health and mental health awareness right so they would get budgets from the city for us to do events that are based off of other aspects of life and i think i think some of that needs to be included in this in our processes moving forward versus just our own brand representation for selling merchandise and skates i think we need to make and or just giveaways and and donating you know skate camps i think we need to go a little bit further towards the the general markets that are outside of rollerblading and then that includes bringing skateboarding and uh bmx and scooters i think it would be nice to see some tours with all of us on tour like i i i talked to like dane berman and some other pro skateboarders and pro bmx riders and we're talking about doing some joint sections and so like that's something i'm looking forward to <laughs> along the process of filming for my vod we're going to be doing uh some sections together so you'll see some clips with me skating with bmx and skating with you know skateboarders i think there needs to be a, a blend of our extreme sports and hopefully at some point we end up on much larger scale tours with these guys and i think that'll put us in in the faces of the masses in a way that me may, we maybe garnish sales and start building and growing the sport yeah i that's a a lot of knowledge in that one. I agree with that too. It's a more of a bigger picture situation now than just us. I feel. Yeah. Uh, next super chat is from Jay O'Neill who says much love for all ablating D where's the VOD. Okay. So I decided to not release the VOD last year because even though it technically could have dropped, I just want to do more with it. I'll give you one spoiler. Um, it's a big spoiler, but uh, my VOD is not necessarily just like a skate section. I want it to be my best skate section that I've ever put out. So I'm taking a little bit more time. I decided instead of just like, let's drop a VOD. Um, and so, but the, the process of it was interesting because I didn't really want to do a VOD, but I started realizing some of the tricks that I planned and I wanted to do were they they were they deserve more than just an Instagram post. So I, you know, Richard's got his professional gear and we decided we'd make it happen. But the storyboard that I've kind of come up with, I'm realistically i'm just visiting skate spots that i grew up watching in videos i'm visiting the skate spots and some of the stunts that i watched these pros do that were my you know my idols like dustin latimer and brian shima and carlos and all these people that i watched skate and they i'm basically going to some of their enders in their sections finding those bangers that I really liked and I'm either matching their trick 
and or just skating it how I wanted to. And it's not to compare myself to them. It's because when I was a kid, I saw that and I thought, what would it take to do that shit? Like, what would it actually take? And so I've been doing that. And along that, it takes work because you got to travel to get to some of these spots. And it's not always easy because you get kicked out of some of these bigger spots. And then you got to get back there. And when you're doing like a really big stunt, that's, you know, hard to do. I can't just go back there when my body's like at 70%. I got to be actually ready to do it. So it's been a longer process. And honestly, one of the hardest things about it is lining up with Richard's schedule. A lot of it was pretty difficult because we are professionals with lives and with children, right? So it's not as easy to actually film for a part. It's a lot easier for me. Some of these Instagram clips that people saw were like, a kid that would ride scooters that bought some rollerblades and he came out and met up for the session and he filmed me and I showed him exactly how I wanted him to film me. So like some of my Instagram clips, they're not filmed by like anybody, but just the homies or people that I met up with. So it's easier to get that kind of stuff out online, but it's been harder for me to actually put it together with Richard. But I'm happy to say that I I'm taking about a good like, from March 20th through pretty much the majority of April, I'm dedicated to finishing my VOD. And if all goes well, we should see a good, you know, you'll not, you'll be seeing some Instagram clips up until then. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping to have it finished, you know, before the summertime. Oh yeah. That's gonna be a fire VOD coming for that shit to come out with you and Rashad working on that together. That's yeah. just going to be money. Uh, I've shown a, a few of the clips to some guys and I've, I've had some good response. So I sure it can't be bad <laughs> compared to the Instagram shit. Um, we have another, su- uh, another super chat from get rolling who says DG respect. How do you think that as a roller nonprofit, we can have a profitable Instagram page that would help us get funding for more programs? Thank you. And much love. That's a good question. Um, you know, I guess putting in the work to make sure that you get guys like me to repost you because spreading the word of your page is going to be most helpful. I think it's, I think bringing what I've known is like an easy way to get your page growth and start getting people to support you is to make sure that your message is clear. So if you're a nonprofit you know, make sure versus making it so colorful or with logos or things, make sure that your story posting and that your Instagram posts that you put out there what it is that your intentions are and really are clear about that. And so look at ways that people, for instance, if they're doing a giveaway, how they highlight the text in which they do it and do that same thing with your personal messages. And so you need to, if you're going to start garnishing, if you say you're a nonprofit and I'll take a look at your page, make sure you message me, but, you know, get that, get that message out and make sure that, I guess I could say that you don't, you don't put your hand out asking for things, but you maybe give back more, right? So if you're giving back and, and you're giving back like as much as you can, the pay it forward mantra, you know, you're most likely going to see more come back. I've only, I've only ever felt like anytime I give more of myself somehow, you know, whether you're spiritual or not, but something, something ends up giving back to you. Law of attraction gives you back more. So, I mean, and then I, I would also say like, Get some get some so, some level of merchandise that you can put out there that you can sell because the community is willing to pay for it. You know, we're all willing to buy something for 10, 15, 20 dollars, especially if, you know, 30, 40 percent of that purchase is going towards a cause that we can resonate with and we can support. So just, you know, get your get your processes going and. And the other thing is, is just don't wait for anything to happen. You got to get that shit started and get to work on it and start posting and post as much as you can. Find viral songs, do whatever, post funny things, 
look at all those clever ways that these people make content and start mimicking that. Why shouldn't rollerbladers have the same kind of viral content that these people have? It doesn't matter what our community can be a part of that stuff too. And it'll only help us get more. And so see whatever, try just have fun trying. Don't be shy. And then one thing, a, a best piece of advice is post and move on. Get things, if you don't feel happy with it, doesn't matter. You're moving on to the next. So it's like fishing. Just keep keep going for it and keep fishing and seeing what gets you more followers, more attention, and more, more support. And do things like this Patreon and make your page professional enough to where people feel like where they're giving, there's actually going to be a return. Not necessarily for them, but for, for whomever your nonprofit is supposed to, you know, benefit. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's a lot of good advice in there. That's a, that's a good lot. Ton of good advice. Um, Fish Yabish asks, what was it like <laughs> to win Bass Bay Area Skate Series in Ho San Jose? That was actually very gratifying because the if you were there in person and you saw the level of skating that everybody was skating at, it was pretty intimidating. I was also still very injured from the Bashi Pope uh, contest. And I, I didn't really say this. I don't even, I might have wrote about it, but at the start of the contest, my back tweaked, like before I even started skating the ledge. And then I could hardly breathe because I couldn't straighten my back out. So I was like, I was in a lot of pain. And then by the time that contest uh was about to finish. I don't know if you were, were there or if, but the people that were there, they knew that like on one of the times going down the rail, I fell like on a true topsail. I landed it, but I hit the, the dirt mound at the end of that river rail. And I, it almost like popped my knee out of socket. But somehow I like, somehow I braced it and I supported, but what it did do was it like, pretty much tore my quad muscle and hurt and stretched my groin. It was a, it continued all the way to blade cup, that injury actually. But, um, it, I couldn't get into a squatted position in a soul grind. So I couldn't even stand. It was hard to walk up the stairs and I went to try to skate the rail and my leg was completely giving out. It just was like, I, I, physically couldn't skate it was done and i was like oh my god this sucks like i'm physically done now i can't be sparta and just thug life through this and luna um anthony luna uh luna god gang or whatever right he was there and he looked at me and he was like he could tell that cameron or you know or somebody else was going to possibly take the win because they were skating all day good and they were still skating and like a few people were still trying to get some tricks but Cameron Talbot who's amazing such a nice guy he was still going hard and he had hit a bunch of tricks and I had only hit like true Mizu and like true topsail I hadn't tried uh doing the transfers yet and so my quad was gone and I was like I tried two or three times to go up to the rail. And I realized that I, there was, I just wasn't physically possible. My leg couldn't jump. I actually couldn't use the muscle. And then like Luna came to me and was like, bro, all you need is like one or two more tricks, dude. Just, just do something, please. Like you got this, you're going to win this contest. And I was like, all right, man, I'll see what I can do. And I did my little breathing technique and I used all my energy that I could. And then I went for it and I ended up three tricks, like back to back to back I did. And it was like pretty cool, but I did X grind <laughs> down the whole rail. Cameron had done that too, but I did an X grind. That was my first trick. Then when I landed, it gave me enough adrenaline to go right back up the stairs. Then I went up the stairs and I went, Top sole, top sole to top sole. And 
like everybody freaked out. And then I went back up the stairs and I went top soul, top soul to true top soul. Yeah. And then it was like, I came back up the stairs and I was like, Luna, I'm done, bro. Like, and he was like, you won. you won, don't worry about it, sit down. And then, and then I won. And it was an awesome feeling because, you know, you got like Charlie and all these guys up there and like the, the NorCal scene is, it has a, an interesting vibe for me because there's a lot of love for me up there. But I feel like back in the day, like NorCal and SoCal almost like battled, right? When Battle My Crew was a thing. So like we were like separate crews. So you never really skated together and it was almost like a battle. Like now it's just like full love and all these people like Reduta and just, I mean, it's just so much love up there. So, I mean, it was, it was, an, it was just an awesome time I felt. And you know, the, the side note to that is I was actually on a job up in Cupertino and you don't get days off in my job. And I knew I was going to have a light day where they didn't really need me. And I was trying to sneak out of the job around noon and get to the contest late. But I had complained about getting that day free so many different times that finally my project manager tells me like, D, I'm just going to let you have the day off, but it's a paid day off. And like, you never have to take that. They, they should have just paid me and let me have the day off. I have a fortunate job, by the way. But anyways... <laughs> They should have paid me and let me have the day off because I could have gone there for a couple hours. They really didn't need me anyways. But the bastard made me take it paid the day off. And so I lost $800 instead of working there. But I went to the contest and I won like 18 right? Or something like that, like 16 1700 bucks. So it was That's worth nice. it. And it was, so I made my money that I gave up on. So what people didn't know is I gave up $800 to go skate that contest. And then I, you know, so it was nice that I won. There you go. You recouped it, man. <laughs> recouped. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're taking our last super chat right now. Um, thank you, everyone who gave super chats and uh, Patreon questions and everyone who joined us live. If you're still watching us live, please hit the like button. We appreciate that. And shout out to uh, Blank for sponsoring us again. Blank by Blank. It's Blank. Just Blank, blank, blank by Blank. Blank, just blank. Um, Sean Carter asks, when you won the Seattle street battle, we just keep on talking about contest. Contest. Keep crushing, man. <laughs> you did an Ali top horn and you said you should do it when your other foot, with your other foot that's not broken. <laughs> Is your ankle broken? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. I know when I was skating that, I mean, shit, I, well, I had my broken finger and I think I had my ankle was, oh, I had just like been done skating like Arizona and all this stuff. And I, my, my foot was pretty much like fractured, but it was mostly my ankle because I had been going like I did this kink rail. I think it was 70, 70 or 80 times. Like, you know that clip on Instagram where I do, in Arizona, I do top soul, I hit the flat, and I jump up to the right? Oh, yeah. Chad had done it. Mm -hmm. Well, that rail was really difficult to skate. And I literally, I had done my first tricks right away, and then to get that switch up, I top sold that kink rail like 70 times. Oh. In like 105 degree weather. <laughs> and it, it physically broke my ankle and foot to where like I couldn't like anytime I went to go skate like my Achilles would give out and my foot was all messed up so I can't remember if I made a comment about that but I'm sure I <laughs> joked about something but I will say at that street set or that that contest which is cool because I had good memories because I had won that contest back in the day I'd skated against Cameron Carr too there was like OG memories with that contest, but, um, and then Aaron Feinberg was there, Anton Kennedy, there was so many good people. But I do remember the last spot when I hit the full cab back backslide to True Spin Soul. I remember when I was like spotting that trick out and somebody looked at me and they're like, you're fucking crazy, you ain't gonna try that. And I was like, I remember being in my head thinking like, I didn't hear them at all. And I was just like focused on not dying because that trick was really dangerous for that rail. When you landed at the base of that rail, it was like marble. 
So who knows what I was joking about, but I mean, I was breaking my body off at that time, but either way, it was a great contest and so much love up in Seattle. But uh, thank you for the question in general. Very cool. Hell yeah. Well, um, we don't have any more super chat questions and we've been going for three hours. It's been incredible. And it's been, Demetrius, we have to have you on again because we have so much more to talk about, but we are going to keep you if we can for like another two 10, or three 15. sections, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm yeah. We'll, go over some we'll of these old sections. Is that okay? If we keep you for yeah, a bit? Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I awesome. want to say, I want to say thank you to everybody. I, I see that majority of people that were in here watching, they stuck around for this whole time. And that's, um, that means a lot to me. It really does. I mean, it's, it's tough to say, you know, but it's, it's it's so inspiring to know that I've had so many people in my corner and also just interested to see what I'm doing and hear what I have to say. I talk a lot. I know it can be exhausting, but um, hopefully some of the things that I talked on tonight either entertained everybody and or gave them some nuggets of advice that maybe go with them. But uh, I really appreciate you guys giving me this opportunity to, to talk to you and to... Um, put myself out there and I'm sure we'll be doing it again. Yeah. I think that you had so much insightful stuff to say in this, in this period of time, there was so many just nuggets of gold and so much like wisdom within all of it. And I really liked your philosophy on a lot of things and it was cool to hear your perspective on a lot of that. So I'm really happy you got into it as, as you did. Of course. uh, Yeah. 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 I was going to ask, we always ask if, uh, you know, before we end the show, if anyone has any shout outs, um last words um thank yous things like that um so feel free yeah well first and foremost i want to you know shout out my daughter athena she's my she's my just joy and everything and you see me skating with her and i gotta do a little bit more for her instagram page i want to get her big um but it's been such a fun time she's got no fear and shout out to her mother, um, Nancy, who does an amazing job for her. And and while I'm on the road, is always taking care of her and is just a great supporter. Because without having that stability and that that family type support for one another, it wouldn't be as easy for me to be out working and skating and putting myself out there. But uh, it's just it's a blessing to have that support system and I'm just so happy to have my daughter and I wanted to mention her for sure. Um, but my, there's, you know, the supporters, I just, I want to shout out to the, you know, everybody from one trick a day, Richard and Tom and Anthony uh, Williams, you know, showcase just everybody who shows me a lot of love and support and the light, light work crew, you know, Chavo and, Everybody there that's just there. Everybody shows me a lot of respect and keeps up uplifting me. And it's been awesome. And I just I can't say thanks enough to everybody on Instagram who's constantly showing me support. Everybody that makes a comment or sends me a message and it's with with love. It's just it's very well received and it gives me inspiration to keep going. I'm going to keep going anyways. But when I'm out there skating, sometimes when I'm about to break, I think about the comments and what people are looking up to and how inspired they've been. And it motivates me just that much more. So I want to give you guys a big thank you as well for, for everything you've been doing for me. So, and then as well as you and Austin, Billy, for continually reaching out to me to make sure that we would sit down and take this talk. I do. I respect that you guys have been so professional and I just, I want to say thanks for, you know, giving me this opportunity. So it's been, it's been awesome. Hell yeah. Demetrius, we appreciate you coming on. You've been one of our, like we said at the top show, one of our highly requested guests. So there's a reason for that. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Um, Stick, stick around though. We're going to do that Patreon content right after this. Um, Everybody else who's watching. Thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, Subscribe, hit the like button and we'll catch you all on the next one. Thanks guys.